Welcome to Beery Good Entertainment. Beery Good Entertainment is brought to you by Good Vibrations, promoting an open attitude toward sexual health and pleasure since 1977. If you would like to support Beery Good Entertainment, please click on one of our affiliate links at lolalaracy.com or sorcererzero.com forward slash podcast. From all of us at Beery Good Entertainment, we'd like to thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful having a voice in 2017, and we continue to look forward to talking about everything affecting us and entertaining us in 2018. Have a wonderful new year. Cheers! Yeah, you see it. You can suck my steel-plated pussy. I'm Sorcerer Zero, uh, <laughs> and my friend is Lola, also known as Queen Xenomorph. We're you know you want to suck it. It might be a little cold, but after a while, you won't even notice it. That's right. That's right. We're here to talk some politics and some beer. So, shall we talk about some beer? Sure. What What have you got going today? Well, the funny thing is I didn't put anything in the refrigerator. I meant to this morning. I thought about it when I woke up and then it just went out of my head like everything else. Um, and so nothing's really cold. Um, and I thought about getting a bomber, but I knew we were doing two beers. And I was like, if I get a bomber, I'm going to be like, you know, I'm just going to be all full and, and bloated and stuff. I was like, no. So I ended up getting... And I don't, hopefully I haven't done these on the show, on um, our scanner drum show. We'll find out. But I got Muhu, which I love. Muhu. I love the name of that. It, it just sounds, sounds so delicious. Good. It is. It's like a better Yoohoo. It is so good. I haven't even opened it yet. And it's Terrapin, so it's Georgia. So that means it's Jason approved, which is very important. Um, if you want to um, click on me, it'll white box me so that folks can see. Aha, uh -huh, there you go. <laughs> I guess it doesn't show me. I, I still look tiny, but I guess, okay. But that's Terrapin, and let's open it up. Look, more cowbell. How cute is that? Can you see it? More cowbell. More cowbell. <laughs> Best Saturday Night Lights give ever. Um, and it's a malt beverage, of course, with natural flavors, um, chocolate milk stout. Oh, God, I love chocolate milk stouts, chocolate porters. I love it all. I just, I just drank a whole glass of milk, so I'm totally in the mood for like chocolate milk. And that's what I've got. And you know, I mean, oh, it's seasonal. Yeah, it's a seasonal. I've been waiting a year. It came out last year, and I've been waiting a whole nother year. I'm like, ah. And a friend of mine at work, who I turned on to Muhu, he said he got it at an ABC. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the ABC I go to isn't quite as cool as other ABCs. So I went to my ABC, and the dude was like, I tried to get it, but I couldn't. And I'm like, damn it. But then I went to Beer 30, which I don't know if it's related to your Beer 30, if they're like distant cousins. Maybe they, you know, five generations back, they were cousins or something. Well, you um, is your beer 30 is a store right well it has a bar in it it's a store and a bar oh okay okay yeah so but anyways they have really good stuff they also had what's behind me which is going to be my second beer the nip nip smuggler oh wow god it's so good that may be that's one of the best beers in the world funky buddha is where it's at I asked, I asked our local to look into getting Funky Buddha. It's awesome. It's the best brewery I have ever had. I mean, it is the best. I just, I cry when I think about them. It's so good. <laughs> so, but, you know, Terrapin's like a close third or something, you know, it's, 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 it's up there sort of ish. And this is a really good one. I get a little bit of the chocolate, not so much. It really just, tastes like a stout I mean smells like a stout but as far as the taste goes I definitely get the chocolate it's like right there 
or like a like like is it like chocolate milk no it's not quite like that i wouldn't even though it says it's milk chocolate it doesn't really taste like milk chocolate it tastes more like cocoa like someone put cocoa nibs in it, it has a strong oh. taste like almost dark cocoa so Ooh, that's it's just, really nice it is it's very good and here's the head i'm not good at pouring so it's probably more head than it's supposed to have that looks like a pretty good head to me yeah i like the. i actually like the color of the head uh-huh the white instead of like a dark brown mm -hmm. and i have no idea what's responsible for that <laughs> me neither i don't know if it's the type of malt they use or if they put maybe if they put lactose in here maybe that colors it somewhat maybe. i'm just spitballing out my butt <laughs> so i don't know which would be very painful but would be a very talented thing for someone to do if they could like actually hit something <laughs> Yeah, it, it would bring a new meaning to, meaning to the game cornball or cornhole. Oh. Oh. They like to play that at work. It's called cornhole, and it's kind of like ski ball. You just throw the ball and see if you get it in the ring. So, mm. yeah, I like my version better. It's more artistic. But anyways, so it's it's pretty good. I like it. I'm very happy. And it's six cans in a pack. Because, you know, sometimes fancy beers only give you four. I'm looking at you, Funky Buddha, with your little four pack. But Moohoo, you know, I know. Moohoo, they do it right. It's six in a pack. And it's not horribly expensive. I'm going to say I paid probably eleven ninety nine. you know, for six. Yeah. So for, for Okay, for a seasonal release, I will accept that. And for an upper echelon beer, I mean, this isn't like something you buy in the grocery store. This yeah. isn't, you know, I mean, this is a little more high end than what you get most places. So eleven ninety nine is acceptable. Like with Funky Buddha, Funky Buddha, you know, that can be a lot more expensive. And like Southern Tier, we know that Southern Tier can be expensive. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And the more politics you get into, the more beer you need. <laughs> right, because you got to deal with it or else you think you're going to just crawl into a hole and cry and just die from sadness. Yes, yes. And as women, we've been getting, well, I won't say we've been getting the shaft because it hasn't been very enjoyable. So we haven't been right. getting the shaft. We, we've been kind of getting the crumbly bits. Yeah, if I get the shaft, I, I, wanna be, I want it to be consensual. That's so. right. I'm all about getting the shaft as long as I'm okay with it. As long as I've asked for the shaft. And, and I like to be in control too. Yeah. So. In this case, you know what? I honestly thought this the other day. When I think about Trump, my vagina feels like it's crawling back up into itself. Yeah, really, because, oh my God, the policies. The policies just are. Him. it feels like he should just walk out on stage and say men train your women well it, it kind of seems like that's what he's trying to do did you see the meme with um from the inauguration where he gives melania this awful look and at first she looks sad and she looks down and then she looks up and she just looks really annoyed yeah, I know. You saw that? That would be crazy because now I want to know what he said. I, mean, I know. I want to make her feel like that. Uh, he could have said anything. That That's when, when really I felt like my vagina was crawling back into itself. I and, was like, you. Yeah, the inauguration was when I decided to make this shirt. I love that. That is perfect. Do you, the back, you, the back the, of it actually lists, you know, everything. That I am. Brewer, brewer of beer, writer of books. I can't read the set, the third one. Open source geek, gamer girl, champion of human rights. I love it. That's your Daenerys title. <laughs> Stormborn. Geek Stormborn. Gamer. Yeah. Champion of it. human rights. Yeah, we all need a Daenerys. Um, title. I needed yep. to narrow the title. So would you, would you be amenable to cutting meat out of your diet if it could be replaced with 
a vegetarian substitute that tasted like meat or would it be gross? Well, like, okay, there's a show that I love that's not on anymore called Better Off Ted. And in one of the episodes, um, it's like a, a um, R&D type place, research and development. And the scientists were working on like grown, lab grown meat. And it would have been a great idea, except for it tasted horrible. Nobody liked it. But I mean, I'm on two minds about it because part of me is like, yes, if I can get the sensation of eating meat without killing an animal, that would be awesome. But then there's the other part of me that, you know, I, I, I don't like the idea of, um, of like Monsanto's and, you know, or um, what do you call that? Um, like the manufactured food like that, manufactured oh, weed. Yeah. yeah. So I think about that and I'm like, what are we opening up ourselves up to? If we're letting scientists make our food, you know, that's a lot of responsibility to put in these people's hands. We don't know what they're putting into it. So it could even work. We could end up in an even worse situation. Yeah. If we don't know what's going into it. Yeah. I can, mm -hmm. I can see that. I have tried a few products lately that really tasted super close. Like okay. there have been a few products, like I couldn't, if I had closed my, if I had just closed my eyes and be given the food, I would not have been able to tell the difference between a regular burger and this yeah. type of burger. And it was completely vegetarian, completely vegan. And that's okay with me because I mean, I'll eat Bubba burgers. You know, for a long time I was vegetarian and I think I would feel a lot better about myself. I would feel more closely aligned with my beliefs if I were a vegetarian again. But it's just hard because I live with someone who's not a vegetarian and we share the same meals and, you know, just don't feel like I'm quite in a place to narrow my, my choice of food right now. Yeah. But ideally I would like to get to that point again. And, if they can give me a slab of meat that tastes like the real thing, as long as I know it doesn't have some kind of weird thing in it, it doesn't have like hormones or antibiotics or anything. And as long as I know that they're not harming the environment by making it, because if it's some kind of lab grown thing, how, what goes into making this? What are they doing to the environment in order to make this? So there are just so many considerations. That's very true. That's very true. We've been, we've been looking through kegging systems mm -hmm. for our homebrew okay and you know what it's oh, what a pain in the neck you have to have a keg and then you have to have tubes and you have to have a separate co2 canister and you have to have everything at the right pressure and there's so many buttons and tubes and things and you have to clean it all and between mm -hmm. it and it's so complicated that I went mm -hmm. to 30 and I saw somebody walk in with this little compact keg that you poured from. Okay. It's fabulous. And I decided mm -hmm. I had to get one for my husband because, you know, my husband drinks a lot of beer. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. <laughs> but, you know, if you benefit from it, this is the secret gift of the secret to gift giving. Yes. Get something you know they'll love. But if you can benefit, it's a bonus. That's right. That is absolutely it's, it's a win-win for everybody. So we both love this item. Nice. I will show it to you and I will actually, I will show it to you and I will demonstrate it for you. Nice. Oh my goodness. It looks like a hookah keg. This is, it's, it's called a U keg. Okay. So you keg your own, I guess. I guess you can your own. Uh, like you haul. Uh, you can. Now this is this is an entirely this is a gallon size. Okay. 128 ounces. There are 64 ounce uh, varieties. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna give this to Chase so that I can. I'm gonna give the camera to Chase so I can demonstrate it. Okay. Wow. And there is there's a little pressure thing down here that tells mm -hmm. you your pressure. Okay. And the cap up here actually turns that you you put you put the little a little co2 cartridge inside the cap and then mm -hmm. you, you regulate the pressure by turning the little knob on top and then you unlock it and you pour it so awesome 
Look at that. <gasps> that is beautiful. That is gorgeous. It looks like it came straight out of the tap. It did. It that did from your home. It did. Straight from the tap. Yep. And uh, <laughs> awesome. Perfectly carbonated. It looks awesome. Oh, it looks so solid and just uh, punkish. I mean, yes. that, it's beautiful. And this little, it, uh, that locks the. Uh -huh. So it won't go anywhere. So you can okay. it. And I've been transporting this in my backpack. That's awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Lola Laracy. I'm coming from the Speakeasies in Chicago and New Orleans. And I got my hat on, which lets you know that it's like the 40s or 50s in England. 40s here, 50s in England. Um, and I'm here with my gumshoe friend, Linda, Sorcerer Zero, who's has some kind of speaking going on behind her. It's a speak easy, <laughs> not a speak loudly. Learn the difference. <laughs> and so we're here to calmly and coolly talk about an awesome show called The Bletchley Circle. It um, is available on Netflix. And just to summarize, even though we said we weren't going to summarize, now I feel this urge to summarize. Um, it's a story of a group of friends who were all together in the in World War II. They were code breakers, um, part of a secret government um, organization at Bletchley Park, and they helped crack the German codes that helped us win the war. And but eight nine years later, they've been shoved back into their normal lives. But unfortunately. The world isn't accommodating to them and they've grown as people unfortunately the world has not grown with them but one of the awesome things about them is they solve crimes and this time the crime hits home one of their own millie has gone missing now millie we find out unfortunately millie is such a composed intelligent elegant woman but she has gotten the raw end of the shaft because she's extremely educated. She's too educated to wait tables, which is what she was doing in the last season. Too educated to be mundane. But unfortunately in this world, you know, she, she was doing what she wanted to do. She was a translator, it was awesome. She had a great job, she had decent money, and she was making her own way in life. But because she dared make the wrong people angry, she had that taken away. So now she has no other recourse except make her own business or make her own way in sort of an underground type business, which is a lot, what a lot of people did back then because you know, they couldn't find legitimate work. And so they did what they felt like they had to do. And unfortunately, she finds herself mixed up with somebody with an organization who was not good at all. They are horrible people and they do horrible things. And she is kidnapped. Terrible. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and oh, I got to hand it to the British drama scene. Yes. Yes. Man, they made this really nerve wracking. This was, this was a super nerve wracking episode for me. Yes, very much. Me too. Millie, Millie has always seemed so put together. Mm -hmm. So, so mm, I know what to do. Yeah. And now she's completely undone. She's and running and vomiting. Here's, total trigger warning for anybody who is considering watching this there is blood there's yes. bodily fluids there's violence yes <clears throat> torture um yep. slavery um you know tra human <clears throat> trafficking which is the most disturbing part of it and you uh well <clears throat> Before we go any further, I'm actually going to, uh, because I'm coughing, I need my cure. Yes, you need, yes, you need to hydrate. And this week, our truth is that education is not going to be educating anymore.
Yes. Education is dead. That's it. That's it. You know, I am totally of the opinion that ignorance can be fixed. Ignorance right. can be fixed by asking. Ignorance can be fixed by reading a book, by checking out different sources. But stupid, mm -hmm. stupid cannot be fixed. Stupid is the willful ability to be ignorant. The, the willfully, I am ignorant and I don't care because I'm Betsy DeVos. Because they want to. Yes. They want to serve themselves. That's all they care about. Cybernaut said you can't fix stupid and for us to Google it. So are we supposed to Google you can't fix stupid? Is that no, what we're I'm supposed gonna, to do? I'm going to do that. Google you can't fix stupid. There's Ron. Oh, Ron White. Ron White is a big component of you can't fix stupid. There is a wiki entry. You can't fix stupid. Oh, oh this wiki we entry has like 21 entries. Oh, oh my goodness. There's oh. a lot of, there is a lot of stuff on Ron White, you can't fix stupid. I guess so. I guess he really yeah. means it. You can't Urban, fix stupid. Yeah, Urban Dictionary, Facebook, Rooter. Oh, man. See? I'm right. I'm totally right because the internet says so. Urban Dictionary. If the kids are saying it, then it's right. I'm sure you'll probably be, uh, You'll probably be glad of the alcohol by the time we get in the middle of the discussion about uh, Betsy. Uh, Betsy Wetsy. Oh my God, that's a good name for her. I like that. But we're gonna say her name once, and then we're going. We can uh, we can refer to her either as Betsy Wetsy or Bellatrix Lestrange. Strange. I like your name better. Yeah, because she's evil. And, ugh, and she's just like with Bellatrix. She was always just finally and getting her nails into you and she was just always a thorn and that's what this lady feels like for everybody for anybody who does not know what we are talking about in the united states we just had an election we elected donald trump president oh god it still feels <laughs> like a joke in a, just in case you hadn't heard you know i okay. know i know that you would have had to be seriously out of touch uh, but we also started, he started nominating his cabinet and, um, in his cabinet now as secretary of education, he has nominated Betsy Devos. Devos? I, don't, I don't know how to say her name. Devos. E -V -O -S. Mm -hmm. We are henceforth going to refer to this woman as Bellatrix Lestrange. If you don't know who Bellatrix is, type it into Google. And you'll find it. And you'll find her. Yeah, you'll know. Yes, absolutely. This this woman, oh my god, this blows my mind. I mean, come on, could you could you snatch anybody out of the Bible belt that's worse than her? A teacher. At least get a teacher. At least get a teacher who understands the difference between quantitative and qualitative <laughs> education. Right. And someone who has experience in public education and who has respect and admiration for public education. What she wants to do is basically privatize all education and shove every single kid under a certain social status or monetary status. Shove every kid under a certain monetary status, just under the rug and forget about them. Like they're going to become, they're just going to become wards of the state anyway. Who gives a crap about them, whether they actually learn anything or not? Well, and she's never been affected by that because she's a billionaire. She was born into money. Yeah. She went to private schools. Her children went to private schools. She has no personal stake in public education and she couldn't care less about mm -hmm. it. She, she is for vouchers. She thinks that she should get a tax break to send her children to private schools. And she's also a proponent of homeschooling. Now, I used to have a very low opinion of homeschooling because in my mind, the people who wanted to homeschool were the people who wanted to tell their children that people had only been around for 6,000 years and that dinosaurs and, and people walked together. But in the last few years, I've opened that up a little bit because I do kind of understand that there are people who are more like me who want to homes who would want to homeschool their children because they want to control 
not even controlled. They want to make sure that their children are getting a well-balanced education. And sometimes the only way to do that is to do it yourself. Another reason for homeschooling is that perhaps your child learns at a different rate than mm -hmm. a lot of the other kids. Now, mm -hmm. in a public school, I think a I think both of us can attest in a public school, you are held to a specific standard of how fast you learn. Yeah. If you don't learn fast enough, you're held back. Uh -huh, it's yeah. Really humiliating. It if is. you're homeschooled, if you're homeschooled, you're not, you're not held to that standard. You're, you know, you're taught at your pace. And not so Maybe you learn, maybe you, maybe you do history and English at a really rapid pace. Mm -hmm. When you hit math, it's, it's kind of like having to chew on a rawhide bone. Mm -hmm. It's just really tough. Mm -hmm. That's okay. <laughs> we just need to go a little slower. <laughs> and take a little more time. You may only need an hour for English, but four hours for math. That's okay. Hi there everyone, this is Sorcerer Zero and you are listening to Beery Good Entertainment number nine. This is our political show and today we are talking about respect and chivalry. I am, I am attempting to stop the YouTube. I know, it happened to me too. I am, like joined, I am joined with my really good friend Lola Laracy. Hi Lola, how you doing? I am, I put my nine point whatever percent abv beer away so i only drank half and now i'm going to do um baileys and la Croix. oh lovely now i still have quite an amount of yes, my 14 percent beer left but i just can't stand it i have to start something new what is that here go let me white box myself sob sob Oh, Son of a Baptist. Nice. I love that. I have never heard of that. Yes. Made epic, epic brewing. How cool a name is that? Epic brewing. Epic. It's epic. Epic brewing says Son of a Baptist coffee stout with cocoa nibs made with real local coffee. That looks awesome. So I'm guessing that's an Oregon thing, huh? I don't know. I have no idea know. where epic brewing is. I actually have no idea where Epic Brewing is. Uh, Let's do a proper shout out. Epic Brewing. It's from Epic Oregon. No, just kidding. Epic Oregon. <gasps> we have Boring Oregon. Is it in Utah? It's Utah. I think it's one of the very few breweries that I've heard from Utah, Utah. I was going to say, I mean. I got, this, um, I got this at Corvallis Brewing Supply. It was only $2 a can, which is pretty That's bloody pretty reasonable. Nice. Yeah, that's all right. That's pretty good. So for six pack, it'd be what? Uh, Twelve dollars. Yeah, that's a bit much for six Ooh, pack. A bit, really a bit much, a bit much for a six pack, but it's okay for a single can. Yeah, especially so. if you're trying it. If you never had it before. And because I'm I'm running into a little bit of a a glass hole problem here. You I glass have, hole. I have I have a fourteen percent in this, and I have a cold toddy in this. Nice. So I, I'm running out of glassware. I'm going to have to use my wine glass. <laughs> oh, no. It still has a nice That's open space. So I should be able to it smell it. it look, I mean, it, it doesn't look any different than what I have. It just. Oh, yeah. Have, yeah. Yeah. It looks the same. Nice. Oh, you can smell the coffee from the can. Oh, good. Nice. Oh, white boxing, white boxing. Definitely why for those of you for those of you listening to the podcast we're uh, we're recording on YouTube so uh if you want to watch this beer feel free to go to YouTube you can also find me on Twitter and Facebook under Sorcerer Zero where can they find you Lola Twitter at Lola Laracy L A R I S C Y um and also Google Plus and that's pretty much it that those are my homes oh that looks oh. very nice very dark. Now I think mm -hmm. I poured I poured quite a bit of this, a little bit more than I meant to. Um, it's hard to tell because I'm actually I I share all these beers with the wonderful yeah. person in my life, with your um, partner in life and in crime, partner in life and crime, and he is also the one that helps make the podcast happen. Shadeen, 
He's also trying known to... as Corelltis. Yes. Ooh, that's a nice. That's now you can see pretty. the color of the head on that. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Very coffee. Very, very coffee. Good. So we both got coffee tonight. Nice. Okay. So we're going to be hyper and drunk. Oh my God. I wish I had like three more cans of this. Oh, you need to go get more. Dude, this is, this is like, <clears throat> okay. So, so cocoa nibs are a little, I won't say understated, but backstated. They're okay. in the back. They're Saddle. present, but they're in the mm -hmm. back. They're, they're a supporting player. Okay. I could see that. This is like somebody carbonated a cup of coffee and threw just a little bit of chocolate into it. Cool. And cooled it off and put it in my glass. Oh, that sounds wonderful. It is. It's if you like coffee, son of a yes, Baptist. I do. Is totally for you. I uh man, if I can find this again, I am I am totally gonna send this because it is really good. Now I wish it were like Friday or Saturday so I could wake up in the morning and drink something like that. Motorboat it. That's what I want to do. I want to motorboat it. <laughs> oh my goodness. But that's oh my god, that leads right into nice. our discussion. Uh, motorboating coffee. Well, motorboating in general. Not everybody, believe it or not, not everybody knows what motorboating is. Do not uh, look yeah. it up on the internet. Do if if you're like 75 or, years old, just don't look it up on the internet. You will not or don't look at images. Don't, don't look at images. images. Don't look at videos. Don't look at, videos. Look at the text. Don't look at the videos. Understand that it's 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 like it's a sound you make when you put your face against something of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And some people like to do it. <clears throat> it's very enjoyable in a sexual fashion for yeah. for many people. And then for others, it's super disrespectful. It, to me, it's disrespectful if someone's being an ass and they're talking about motorboating someone they don't know who has no interest in them and they're just being a dick-ass jacktard. That's when it's disrespectful. Now, when it's someone you are actively engaged with and they want to do it, all right, let's go for it. I may actually do it back, you know? So it depends on the context. So much to me depends on the context. That's very true. Uh, how about comedians? Well, once again, it depends because you could you could have a lesbian comedian who talks about it, and that doesn't offend me. So, what's the difference between that and a male comedian doing it? I don't know. It just hmm. really depends on the context. I mean, I think maybe if they're only talking about motorboating as a way to illustrate a woman's physical attributes right. without any other consideration for what yes. a woman is that's disrespectful like you know talking about walking into a club and like oh my god she's got you know the women the Grab women have the yeah. the women have these giant tits you just want to on oh look at her i just want to boo never there mind that she's jerk or you know she doesn't even know you exist that totally disrespectful you're just yeah. being an asshole man right. woman uh transsexual transgender if you're that's all you're talking about you're an asshole <laughs> yeah you're you're just a shallow person and and when you think about it now that you said it in a in a comedy aspect in like a, a stand-up comedy aspect there really is no legitimate way to talk about that because in the sexual context that we we're talking about where you're complicit in it you're enjoying it that's private that's not something a stand-up comedian would talk about so well i think george carlin talked okay. about it george carlin was 100 percent in your face offensive all the time to make the point of what was offensive yeah he he wanted you to to know this is offensive. He 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 wanted you to be yeah. aware that it existed. Exactly. He was he was so offensive because he wanted you to know it was out there and this is the way it goes. And just flat out, I'm being an asshole because you're being an asshole. Yeah, I can see that. 
And that's a bit of subtlety that some people, you know, it, it's a fine line because we, we appreciate that, you know, that's more of a parody type thing. Um, so we can appreciate that he was being offensive while not really being offensive. Yeah. We can kind of see that subtlety, but some people may not, they may just straight up say he's a jackass and he was being offensive. That's how they feel. That's, and that's how he made them feel. So, yeah. And it's not just, I don't think it's just about our boobs because as a woman, I actually, I actually think that my boobs are great. I enjoy being a woman and I think that having boobs are a pretty bloody good thing for me as a woman. Okay, all boobs are different, but I don't want to be known just for my boobs. No, I don't think anyone does. I mean, I'm a little over 40. My boobs are not as perky as they used to be. I <laughs> point to Australia. <laughs> They, they, yeah, they know where the shrimp on the Barbie is and they know where it's summer. They point they, down. They, they could dig to China on their own. They certainly could just put some drill bits on them. I think we can make fun of our own breasts because they're our breasts. Nobody else can do that. Not unless they know us and, and, you know, we have that kind of relationship. This is or, or you, or you are the very nice person who is examining my breasts for cancer. And make silly noises while horrendous machine squishes my boobies into pancakes. If you're making hilarious noises, I'm going to All love right. you. And that's okay because that's <laughs> a, that, that is a very uncomfortable position to be in. I have been in that position every year for the last five years. You know, I know what it's like. Really? It's very awkward. I've only done it once. Oh, and yeah. I was so nervous the first time I walked in to do it. Mm -hmm. And the technician was a guy. I actually oh, asked, I actually women. did ask, I actually did ask for a guy because I felt okay. more comfortable than having a woman right. touch my body. But as the machine starts moving down, he goes, <laughs> and I just burst into <laughs> laugh. It funny. was so funny. That and he is... was like, that's what I wanted to hear. But still making you feel comfortable. All for that's, it. That's wonderful. That's that is okay. Awesome. Is that is that respectful or is that chivalrous? Well, I wouldn't call it chivalrous because to really? me, well, okay, I don't is what is the exact definition of chivalrous? Oh, it's, it's specifically the middle aged knights: bravery, military skill, generosity, and and victory, piety, and courtesy to women. So really, it's just courtesy, which which is the way I look at it. Uh, my definition of chivalrous. Courteous and gallant, especially toward women. Gallant, gentlemanly, honorable, res honorable, respectful, honorable considerate. Right. How about you? What did you get for chivalry? Some of the ideal qualifications of a knight, courtesy, generosity, valor, dexterity, um, rules and customs of medieval knighthood, uh, gallant warriors or gentlemen, and fair ladies and noble chivalry i don't really quite know what they mean by that but basically i'm um, just being um respectful like you said the term chivalry is so old yeah i mean if you're coming from the knightly age where women you know where basically women would be viewed as what property Further, yeah so if women are viewed as property, obviously women would have to act in a specific fashion. Yeah. We saw that in Bletchley Circle. We yeah. own you. You act like we tell you to. We don't hurt you. Right. Not respectful. Not chivalrous at all. No, not at all. I'm not sure sh the term chivalry is, well, I'm not sure it's appropriate to a modern age. I don't think so. Holding a door for somebody else is respectful. I think so. Oh. And thoughtful. And thoughtful, yes. Mm -hmm. Automatically holding a door just because somebody is a woman? Ugh. <laughs> you can fuck off, dude. <laughs> well, I am I capable of holding my own door. <laughs> I am capable of opening a door for myself. Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean that, you know, I'm going to walk into the door. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, the only time... 
really the way I experience it is sometimes there's this like unwritten guideline that the woman goes first, you know, the man, he holds the door open. He says, you first, it happens when I go on the bus, you first. And even though it's outdated, old fashioned, and really doesn't have a place in society, sometimes I'm grateful for it because the alternative is an asshole who shows me out of the way. It seems like I either get two people, someone who lets me go ahead of them or an asshole who shows me out of the way. So I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll take the guy who lets me go first, even though sometimes it can be awkward because I used to say, no, no, you go. And then we would, for several minutes, you, no, you go, you go, you go. And the bus driver's like, I'm going. So it would get awkward. So I started just being like, okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me go. That's very kind of you. To me, letting a woman go first, opening the door, all that stuff, it is outdated, it is outmoded, but it's a form of manners that, that has been taught, especially in the South. And I've kind of come to the conclusion that I'd rather have manners. Even if it is a little outdated, at least they're manners because there are too many people out there who have no manners and will shove a door in your face. That's true, but that's that's more respect than okay, if somebody opens a door for me but doesn't, you know, just doesn't say it, it's just, you know, notices like I was walking to Beer 30 the other day. Yeah woman walked in the door a guy noticed i was coming and held the door open for me which is very kind you know what i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say anything i'm just gonna say you know i'm not gonna say anything against it. i'm gonna say thanks for holding the door yeah that's that's fine yeah now i have run into the i have run into ladies first there's really no point for that my response is always no no penises first Ah, oh, so today we are talking about the imitation game. Yeah. Oh, oh, so it was a wonderful movie. I loved it. I just, I love the whole stuff with the Bletchley Circle. By the way, we're on a kick now. I mean, yeah. apparently this is our okay. theme. Let's, we need to find some more Bletchley Park movies. Um, but I love that stuff. That was my favorite part. I was very sad about the part in Manchester afterwards and the part when he's a little boy and he's being beat up and his friend dies and all that. But the stuff in the middle where he's at, you know, hut eight, that stuff is awesome. I really, at first I was, I was skeptical about it at first. Like the first five minutes I was like, hmm. Um, and then the part where they showed the children being loaded up onto the trains because it was wartime. Yes. That really, that, those visuals, 100% of the time, if you put that visual in a movie, mm -hmm. my little heart is going to break. All oh, those little babies going off to stay in the countryside. Yeah, I know. Like, like my husband's trying to talk to me and I'm like, they need mamas. I need a minute. I need a minute. Are they okay? <laughs> Let's look them up. Are they alive? Are they okay? Did they make it? It's, it's just a movie. Did they make it? Yep. Oh, no, I'm not okay. Uh, and and had Che made a Che made a comment that it was very Harry Potterish with all the kids getting on the trains and everything. And it, well, it actually, yeah, kind of, it kind of was in a way. And if I'm remembering correctly, in Lion of the Witch and the Wardrobe, had it they been shipped off during wartime, or am I thinking of a different movie? No, that's true. That's true. They had been shipped off for wartime. So I, I got that magic feel, too, from that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very much children going off into the unknown, parents left behind. Yeah, to suffer, you know, and children coming home, but not necessarily to the same world that they had left. No. So, you know, you have to wonder how Alan's life shifted during the war i mean seeing everything dramatically change like that and is it just me or was he was he on the autism spectrum oh i think so what i've read about it um there's the thing where he he didn't get jokes at all i mean he just did not incorporate humor into his you know behavior and also the way he would stutter a little bit and kind of not quite look at people and his prickliness when 
with social interactions and his his hesitancy to work with other people. I definitely got that. In fact, if it had been now, he probably would have been diagnosed. Now, one of our favorite actors actually played Alan Turing. Yeah. Benny, Benny Batch. Benny Batch. I love me some Benny Batch. Man, this guy was so good. This he guy so was so good. good. Now, the whole humor thing, I'm not quite sure that Cumberbatch played it exact. Okay. Because, like, he seemed to get the fact there was a joke. Yeah. But he just didn't, the humor. He he didn't right acknowledge over. it. Yeah. Like, right he, over, he, knew, he knew something was going on. Some, some kind of interaction there was going on that he just didn't. He but didn't. like he said, short, a short time later, he said, language feels like a code. People talk, but I never understand what they're saying. So he knows that something significant is going on, but he's not catching it. So yeah. And who is his, uh, who is his buddy? Was that math? Matthew Good? Was Hugh played Hugh Alexander? Which one is that? Which um the the Russian spy or one of the oh, other? Oh no, not the Russian spy. The tall guy that um that he became pretty good friends with. Who, who stood up for him? Yeah. You know what? He looked familiar, but I can't remember who he is. Let's let's go to IMDb. Yeah, I'm I'm on IMDb and it's Matthew Good plays Hugh Alexander. I just not not that sure. That name sounds familiar. Let's see. It Matt was. Hugh Alexander was the guy, I think, who who turned around to Joan's friend in the bar. Mm -hmm. And jo Joan's friend, Joan's friend was Joan's friend was like uh, Joan. Joan asked Joan asked her friend, "So how do you know he likes you? Mm -hmm. How do you know he's going to talk to you?" And she said, "Because I looked at him. I looked. I glanced over at him once and haven't looked at him since in fifteen minutes." Yeah, and, and he, that turns means around, he turns around to to um, Alan and says the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she looked at me 15 minutes ago. She wants me. <laughs> I know. I was like, she's just waiting for me to come over. What did you think of the uh, of the spy? Did you actually know that he was to be the, the one letting information out? I was disappointed because he was so nice to yeah. um, Alan. And he was the only one who we know knew about his homosexuality. And, you know, I thought, oh, someone's in his corner. How nice. No, he used it against him. I was like, you mofo, you asshole. Yep. But I I was surprised that Charles Dance knew it all along. Or no, the MI6, it was the MI6 guy MI who knew it all along. Oh, yeah, the MI6 leader mm -hmm. had actually put him into place on purpose. To get information to Russia. So that Wait. they could get help from Russia. Right, which makes sense because it's that whole Cold War mentality. Even though we were technically on the same side in World War II, we were still enemies. Yes. And like they said, Churchill was so paranoid, he wouldn't let any information out. And the MI6 recognized, you know, look, we need all the help we can get. They even said, you know, during the movie at one point, um, Jared Knightley said, you're going to need all the help you can get with this. And MI6 recognized this. So they said, all right, well, how can we do this without doing it? That's another Bletchley um, circle thing. Remember, they said, how can we do this without doing it? Yes, exactly. So that's one of the things I love about spycraft, you know, being super, like, under the radar and, and influencing things without anyone actually knowing it. Mm -hmm. So they put the Russian spy in there. Well, first of all, they could feed bad information if they wanted to, but they could also feed good information. That's true. Mm -hmm. You know, one... One hand washes the other, as the Germans say, or you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Exactly. And that's how we won the war. I liked the process they went through describing how Alan actually created mm -hmm. this monstrosity. And mm -hmm. they totally made it look like a monstrosity. It was it so impressive when it was mm -hmm. done. I was I was giddy looking at it. Like, oh my God, there it is. That's what it. That's what it looked like. That that was it. That's the very first computer. <laughs> computer. And I got so excited when it locked on the codes. Yeah. And, and then I understood was... the second that they sat there and they're they're sitting there and they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. 
right then the, one of the very first lessons in computer science came to me. What? Bloody thing doesn't know when to stop. No, nope, it doesn't. It's going to keep have, going. That is when you make your first program, they drill that into your head. You have to know the program has to know when to stop doing its job. Otherwise, it'll yeah. just keep on going forever. That's what it does. It's a computer. It computes. It doesn't know when to stop. Mm -hmm. I like the whole thing he said about, you know, of course, a computer isn't human, but all of our brains work differently. Who's to say that this brain made out of gears is, you know, any less of a brain than our brain? So mm -hmm. that's a Very. good way to look at it. Very artificial intelligence like. Now, for people who don't know anything about Alan Turing, and I, I know at least one person who's going to listen to this broadcast who knows absolutely nothing about Alan. Um, oh. Alan, Alan created this machine in order to, in order to break Enigma, and mm -hmm. Enigma was was the German's machine that created supposedly the unbreakable code. Mm -hmm. And even after Alan, even after Alan did solve it using this computer to go through codes at what, what was a uh, three, three million different type of codes uh, a minute, something like something, that, something yeah. like that. It was some specific number. Even after he did that, because they very intelligently didn't let anybody know. Mm -hmm. This machine was able to do this for over 50 years with nobody knowing. Nobody mm -hmm. knew for 50 years this machine existed and could break Enigma mm -hmm. over and over. And that's smart. That way, if someone got their hands on it, you know, and tried to use it again, they wouldn't get very far. And more machines came out that were based on Enigma, but didn't work mm -hmm. quite the same. You had to have specific codes in order to make it work. Like we saw, like we saw in Bletchley Circle, there was there was one that depended like on the time of day, and um, different parts, time of day and location, in order to create the correct code. Mm -hmm. But you know, this was this was what they needed, and all it took. It's funny they should talk about this in the Security Plus training because this is a perfect example. They figured it out because one Enigma operator would always start his transition, his um, his transactions with his girlfriend's name. They're supposed to pick five random numbers, but he always used his girlfriend's name. Yes. So they were able to decipher everything else based on what they knew he was putting out there. Yeah, the because they had managed to do it. What was it? Two, two messages, two or three messages. Mm -hmm. But like days later when it was useless to them. Yeah. What is the, what's the one thing the Germans always said to each other? Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. So That's how all they needed. Every single message. You can at least figure that out. So there's one, there's one way to tell the machine, stop when you see this. Mm -hmm. And another one was, you know, in the, the 6 a, what was the 6 a.m. reports that they got? Yeah. There was yeah. always the weather. The weather. Yeah, there was always the weather and the time of day and everything. So it was, you mm -hmm. know, there again is if you're giving a code or bits of information, they're going to be able to figure it out. And Cybernaut says the human is always the weak link in the security chain. And that's true. Oh, we yeah. saw it there. Absolutely. Even and, though uh, well, uh, technically our brains are really good, you know, machines. <laughs> yeah. Our brains give away information that should not be given away. We screw up and make mistakes and people figure us out. Mm -hmm. Well, and plus, sometimes we get confused between memory and fact, or we get facts mixed up. Whereas a computer, it can pull a specific fact. We may get things mixed up. You know, we've yeah. got we've almost got too much, too much information for our computing power. We're like, whoa, we can only do so much. Whereas it's a computer, eh, not so much. Now at now at the end when he's when he sends uh he finally sends Joan who's played by Kira Knightley. Yes, she's so really, pretty. God, she's so pretty. I know. I'm like, oh, I just keep talking. Well, I mean, he won. He makes the wonderful mistake of one giving her confidence in her own abilities. Yes. 
and two, giving her a purpose, yes. you know, allowing her to say, this is my purpose. This is mm -hmm. what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So at the end, when he thinks she's in danger and, she, and he wants to send her away, mm -hmm. she basically tells him to go take a flying leap. And he tries to force her to leave mm -hmm. by saying, I never, I never really cared about you. I don't know. I'm like, dude, don't do that. And like at that, I was so heartbroken because, okay, yeah, their marriage would not have been no. actually fulfilling. No, definitely not. But at least it would have been mentally satisfying. For right. The yeah. And they would have been, they're such good friends. They would have been in each other's lives. Although it's hinted that she was still in his life because she's visiting him 10 years later. And yeah. according to Wikipedia, they stayed close friends. So apparently they made up at some point. Yeah, that, I mean, even that to me is really odd. I don't know how to make it up very well. So it must have been awfully hard for Alan after saying those horrible things, those lies to her. Alan also didn't get body language. No, he pretty much just stood. Yes. As a child, he was he's so stiff. Mm -hmm. And just, I you know, to do that boy. That broke my heart. Yes. Oh, you know what the saddest part for me, though, was mm -hmm. he's in there and the investigator is interrogating him. Yeah. And he says, you know, he talks about the Turing test. Mm hmm about deciding whether somebody is a real person or whether it's, you know, not a real person or, or what they are. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to say some things and then you get to be the judge. Yeah. He tells him all this stuff. And then he asks the investigator, so now it's, it's your turn to judge. Mm -hmm. The investigator says, I can't judge you. And Alan, with this, with this absolutely tortured look on his face, that he just leaves crumbles. He says, well, you're not used to me at all. I know. It's so all the answers to his life right there in his hands. And he says, can't give it to you. And Turing's like, well, then why am I here? It's yeah. almost like, it's almost like Turing went before God. He yeah. said, give was me I the right? answer. Was yeah. I right to do all these things? Was I right? Was I wrong? Am, am I a bad person? And there's no answer. If that's the ultimate letdown. You can't yeah. come back from that. When somebody can't give you, somebody can't give you an answer like that, and you can't make that answer in your own head. And then all of a sudden, the, the thoughts just started whirling around his head, and they never stopped. No. And then they wound up convicting him of being a homosexual and chemically castrating him. And just here, reading some of the stuff, like apparently it makes men grow breasts. And it deflates their sex drive. Golly knows what else it does to them. Those are just the measurable symptoms. Could you imagine someone hamstringing your sexuality as part of yourself, part part of your gender? Yeah, I know. I, I mean, for people who are in the process of changing over to the gender they yeah. feel that they are, that's mm -hmm. different. But to lose the gender you are forcibly there again did they have rules about torture i mean obviously homosexuals weren't quite people to them mm -hmm. no matter how much they'd helped you would have thought that maybe maybe mi6 would have sent somebody to help them this you know this this guy might be a homosexual but uh, you need to lay off he's one of ours yeah. well, but this was after the war i mean this yeah. was 10 years after the war and MI6, you know, they had their own stuff going on. They were probably dealing with the Russians at that time. So it's possible that guy, you know, he'd moved on and it was like, sorry, dude, you're on your own. And I was so mad better, at that. It's better than that really hurts. <laughs> I know. I'm like, he's just left. Well, it's not that different than the Bletchley Park women, you know, from the Bletchley Circle who were left behind. They didn't know where to go. They were just... You know, you, you're filled with all this purpose for five years, and then it's just yanked away from you. Where do you go? You just wander around aimlessly. Yes, that's true. Now, as far as Turing's life goes, I, I one of the reasons why I didn't watch this movie for a long time is because I thought it would depress me, because 
he's typically known as, you know, after he went through this horrible occurrence of having to be chemically castrated, he committed suicide. I was actually happy to find an article that, you know, says that may not be what happened. I mean, it's just, it's gray. We don't know. Um, so uh -huh. what could have happened instead? This, this is what people speculate. First of all, the common understanding was that he poisoned himself by injecting cyanide into an apple and eating it before he went to bed. Well, people who knew him said he ate an apple every night before he went to bed and he would often find, you know, fall asleep with it by his bed. So eating an apple wasn't some grand gesture or anything. It's what he did every night. And the apple was not tested for cyanide. Now, one thing I read said that the cyanide poisoning seemed to be more along the lines of um, like smelling it or, you know, some kind of contact versus ingesting it. Now, he did have an experiment at the time, something like one of the one of the things used for the experiment um, used cyanide. I can't remember exactly how it worked, but it did use cyanide in the experiment. Some people conjecture it could have been an accidental poisoning. And his mother even said that he was careless with his chemicals. So there is that possibility. Now, we don't know. There was no note. You know, we weren't in his mind. We don't know. Um, of course, I hope that it was accidental. But at the same time, I say that, but I don't want to take away from the probably thousands of people who really did take their life because of the hell they were put through. So I don't want to say, yay, he was okay, and forget about all the other people who weren't okay. But just in this one case, there is sort of an open-ended question about what actually happened. I, for his sake, well, he's passed on anyway, so no matter what, it still happened. But I, I, hope, I hope he had peace. Let's put it this way. I hope he wasn't distraught. I hope it was an accident so that you know we could say he he had peace in his life that's mm -hmm. what i hope i hope for him that he had peace speaking of packaging yeah yeah that's a good segue speaking of packaging how we package women mm -hmm. is our topic for tonight that is true and how we actually um, sexualize them to an extreme amount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've gone through this a little bit with some of the discussions on uh, like video games. And this happens from, we've seen this from Trump. Mm -hmm. She's from, a six at most. He, yeah, I mean, he's talking about his kid in a sexual way, comparing her to her mother. He would do her. I mean, Some what a way to start a kid's life. Just start yeah. the child out sexually. Yeah. Expecting them to be a sexual being. Mm -hmm. That's that's not exactly fair. But it's all about the brand. Yeah. When you think about Trump, he's all about the brand, and his children are probably part of the brand, too. Yeah, I mean, mm, I don't think I've ever seen Melania in, like, yoga pants and a t-shirt. No. I don't think so. I don't think so either. She always seems to have to be super female. Put together like a Barbie doll. And you Barbie doll. Oh, and there I Barbie dolls are my nemesis. Mm -hmm. My absolute nemesis. Even even when my kids were growing up, I hated mm -hmm. handing out Barbie dolls because yeah here's this image and not only is my little girl mm -hmm. looking at this but what about all the little boys who are playing and these are the dolls that they see these are this is what a woman is supposed to be mm -hmm. and this is what you're supposed to think about you're supposed to think about boobs and butt and waist tiny boobs, waist boobs butt waist right that's it and big <clears throat> little big yeah so you think about boobs butt and waist and men from the time they're little boys are subjected to this this thought process and then we get very angry when they grow up 
and they treat us as boobs, butt, and waist. And you even hear that. You say, are you a boob man or a butt man? You hear <clears throat> that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How awful is that? It demeans us. And then it forces them to make a social choice mm -hmm. based on nothing but physical endeavors. What if they just like the woman? Yeah. Maybe they just like a person. Maybe they just like her. It, it puts them in a corner where they have to justify why they like someone. Well, you know, I, I just like her. I don't know if it's her butt or her boobs. I don't yeah. know. Maybe it's none of the above. Maybe it's all of the above. Why does that have to factor in at all? So are we manipulating men as much as we manipulate women from the time they're little? Is that, is that a manipulation factor, do you think? That, I think that goes back to our show from a few days ago. It could be part of training. Everyone gets trained, um, for better or for worse. We all do. That's part of being a child and being receptive. Um, children mimic what they hear and what they see. Yes. So in some instances, men have these ideals imprinted upon them. And of course, we hope that they see through this and realize that this is just a, a mirage. This isn't real. But at the same time, some men don't get that. They don't see that. And it's, I'm not going to say they're off the hook. I'm not going to say it's not their fault, but I'm also going to say there's precedence for it. There's a reason why this happens. There's a reason why this keeps coming up over and over again. Mm -hmm. They're taught this way. And as women, some of us are taught to flaunt that. We're taught to use it. So it it really comes back to what we've been given from when we were a child. It's the tapes that we were given to play over and over again. And it's up to us to, you know, see through that and kind of make our own way. And that's hard. Yeah. And then of course we, we wind up we wind up being adults and then we have to make those decisions and then we see it in the media, the struggle between whether to be sexual and what is sexual. And I think that is it is the Emma Watson article yeah. mm -hmm. really, really shows that which, which one, which one, which article would you like to share? They both have basically the same summation. Um, so why don't we, why don't we talk about the issue first? What happened? Good idea. Um, do you want to, do you want to explain the, the I'll article? It. I'll do it. Okay. Emma Watson did a photo shoot. God help us all. The world is over. She did a photo shoot. In one of many pictures, she had what I deem to be a very tasteful photo, a very pretty photo. She's wearing all white. She has almost like this, um, kind of 1980s, like Robotron type of haircut. But what's causing an uproar is that she's wearing a little Bodero jacket with nothing underneath. So you see under boob. Yeah, there's no I, way you can, you can't see nipple in this. No, picture. you don't you see nipple. You see the shape of the breast underneath. No, no, you just see under boob. And actually it's the most PG way of showing nudity. I mean, this would probably get okayed on freaking ABC or something. Mm -hmm. it's not distasteful it's tasteful and this is what we're talking about art to me this is more like art this is not sexualization and in fact some people in the comments of one of the articles makes the point that she's you, you couldn't need, you could argue that she's not even sexy in this we're talking about sexualization of women you could argue she's not sexy she doesn't have that you know sexy look her hair is not particularly sexy she's actually kind of um severe looking in it so yeah that's you, true that is very true so a lot of people i guess the controversy comes from a lot of people are tweeting that she's no longer considered a feminist because she showed under boob in a photo shoot well my argument is a feminist is whoever a woman wants herself to be the whole point of feminism is we have freedom to choose we can be who we want to be we can do what we want to do, say what we want to do, and that's a feminist. She wants to show under boob. You know what? I'm a big fan of under boob. I think under boob is great. I like side boob. Now, did the article actually say anything about whether she chose the pose or whether 
you know, she was told she had to pose that way. It didn't. And we're, I'm actually looking at two different articles and I'm going to put them in the U YouTube chat. I don't think they let us do URLs. Let me see. All right. It says remove any web addresses and try and get YouTube. Dang you. All right. For anyone listening who wants to know which articles we're talking about, there are two. There's one from HuffingtonPost.com, and you can probably just search for Emma Watson and find it. And there's another from MoviePilot.com. Yep. And once again, you can probably search for it. Um, and in the MoviePilot.com, they have a link to a video, which I have not watched the video, but it's it. according to the article, it's her talking about Beauty and the Beast, which is the movie she's going to be in. And I don't know if she says if she had any say in the poses, but one of the things I get the sense of from Emma Watson is if she didn't want to do something, she wouldn't do it. I don't think she would do it if she didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's a really important point right there is um, a lot of artists feel contractually obligated to do things they are uncomfortable with. And that's not good. Because the company does want to sexualize them mm -hmm. to get more viewers. Mm -hmm. And that's that's completely wrong to me. It doesn't look like it happened in this. It, and the, the, the photo itself is not actually no. sexual, like you said. It's I mean, her pose is definitely... It's not an inviting pose. She's got her no, arms. She's got her folded, arms. She's got her arms folded across her mm -hmm. across her her mm -hmm. midsection, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and her whole pose says, "You know, I'm just here." It right. does not say, "Come get me, big." No, daddy. it's not come hither. And you could even argue, since she has her arms crossed against her boobs, you could even argue that she's saying, "These are my boobs. Get away." Yes. Yes. You could, you could even argue that this is a feminist. Um, statement because she has her semi bare breast and she is not letting people in. So you could argue that this is a statement, anti sexualization. So basically, the people who are calling her anti feminist, I think they maybe need to look at it again. Um, no, I know that the photo shoot was for Vanity Fair, and Vanity Fair does have an obligation to their um to the the people that they're they're selling you know stuff for. But Vanity Fair actually has been um, a pioneer in a lot of serious issues. They actually, they come out front of a lot of very serious issues. They actually have some of the best um, opinion pieces out there. Mm -hmm. I, I can't name anything right now because I'm, I've been having a lot of beer. But I, I really like Vanity Fair. They really do a good job. They, they make, they make, like several page articles they do real investigative journalism mm -hmm. and they're they're not just pretty faces so i mm -hmm. i actually respect vanity fair a lot and and these pictures make me respect them even more because this is fashionable this is cutting edge but this is not derogatory at all that's and true i mean the the whole the whole photo seems to center on um i believe I believe the the bolero is bolero badero. The jacket. I, I don't know if I'm saying it right. I, I believe the be jacket right. is is Burberry, okay. which is a highly fashionable name. And it it when you look at the photo, your eyes are very drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Almost like this is this is the only piece you know you really need to make your your ensemble work for you. And that that's a good point. It's a very bold statement that's really all you need um and that's part of vanity fair and i'd also like to add that one of the articles mentions this is like one of 12 different photos this is a huge photo shoot so this was not the only mm -hmm. photo shoot and i went to vanityfair.com oh i found another article by the way e online has another article and it says it has a video that addresses her the controversy so if you want go to eonline.com and search for emma watson and they actually have a video but i want to go to vanity fair because i want to see the actual if they have the actual photo shoot or at least a few more photos of it and the, photog the photographer was tim walker mm -hmm. 
I don't know how important that is for people who are listening, but that's who some people may know. I don't know a lot about photographers. I mean, my knowledge kind of ends with Fran Lebowitz. It begins and ends with Fran Lebowitz, and that's <clears> from 30 years ago. But um, all right, vanityfair.com. If someone wants to look at it, it's vanityfair.com slash Hollywood slash 2017 slash 02 slash Emma dash Watson dash cover dash story. And it has some of the photos and they're gorgeous. Oh my God. That first photo is she's dressed in this like ethereal, like gauzy type dress with like beads on her neck and she's staring straight ahead but somebody has their legs up and she's laying down on their on their feet hovering in the air like an angel that's gorgeous she does look like an angel like a trapeze angel because it's like a trapeze pose and keep looking down i mean there's one where she's like blade runner she's got a suit on and she has a, a a Grecian statue head in her hands. Oh yeah. So I mean, one of the things about Vanity Fair is these are all like almost like cosplay, different scenarios. It's it's art. And so what? She showed under boob in one. I'm looking at another one where she's wearing a fencing costume that completely covers her body. Yes. It's just all different scenarios, all different styles. And they picked out the one with underboot. Why don't we start out with a beer? I went, uh, I went first last time. So let's see what you've got. And I've already opened it. Oh my God, this is so good. I think I'm going to have to change this to a five. I've been putting 4.75 on untapped, but oh my God, it's so good. Ooh. Full quarter. Sweet water. It's got hold, now hold quarter. I mean, is that is that supposed to be like a barbecue beer? Yes, it's it's um pork, and it smells like pork. Oh my god, it smells like a barbecue. It smells like I'm at the barbecue joint, and oh my god, I just love it. I just keep sniffing it. It's like, oh my god, I just look silly. I'm just sniffing. <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm gonna die from sniffing. I won't get any actual oxygen. I'm just getting you know pulled porter pork smell but anyways i love this like it says it's made in their dank tank i'm not quite sure I, I, i've heard of dank takes but i really don't know what that means i'm not sure what that means either but the can is really interesting it has you know dank tank on it and then the, the photo is of is that a guy riding a pig yes it that is. is a guy right like like you totally expect to find this guy in like georgia well yeah and this beer is from georgia so, and I'm from Georgia, so, you know, it, it kind of works. I, I was reading the back of it, and this is only in Georgia. Um, it says things like, knock, knock, who's there? It's McDanko's inbred neighbor, Gert Reynolds, swinging by delivering his deliverance with some fat back here and some fat back there. Stepping out past some Foxy Brothers, picking a banjo on the porch to sample his wares. McDanko doubled over the chopping block and squealed like a pig. Proclaiming this to be the most bodacious brew this side of Chattanooga. Slap the thigh and ride the wave. That was hilarious. You really got into that. I did. Sir, yes, sir. I love me some full porter. It's good. Mm-hmm. Now is it is it dark? Let's let's see the beer. I'll, I'll pour a little, little bit more. I already started drinking it because I couldn't wait. Let me pour a little bit more. It had a little bit of a head when I first poured it, but um, not too much, which is kind of what you would expect from a really dank beer. But it's very dark and it's extremely viscous. I mean, when I talk about a meaty beer, I mean this. This is meaty. You could chew on this for days. That looks fantastic. That looks like breakfast in a glass it is it's perfect i I should have drank this this morning forget coffee i should have drank this. i'm just gonna waft some of the aroma towards me (laughs) it smells like a barbecue joint it has that woody smoky smell oh my god it's so good and i'm so glad it i'm so glad it comes in a 16 ounce because that means it lasts longer (laughs) oh god it's so good and I'm very happy to be supporting Georgia tonight because they need all the help they can get, you know, part of their oh. interstate felon. 
Yes, we are. We are very sorry to hear about. And I'm so glad nobody got hurt. I am so too. glad nobody got hurt. But I mean, mm -hmm. there is a gigantic hole in the middle of Fort George's freeway system right now. I, and that's a big interstate that connects a lot of different states together. So I mean, that's like the main artery through Atlanta. And apparently, it was arson. That's what I read <gasps> today. Yep, that's what I read today. They've arrested some people on arson charges. Jerks. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's some messed up stuff. Absolutely. I don't think, it didn't sound like terrorism. It sounded like homegrown jerks, you know, just getting yeah. their... Well, you need a beer off. after that one. I know. Yeah, I'm sure plenty of people in Atlanta need a beer after trying to get home. Yeah, so we totally, we, we totally approve of home. Jordan oh, oh. beer efforts. Yes. Yes, they've got such good beer. Oh, this is such a good beer. It tastes so good. It's so viscous and you can just chew on it. And it's, it's got super that... sweet. No, it's more smoky than anything. I mean, it, it almost tastes like, it tastes like I'm eating something charred. A bit charred wow. in a good way. Yeah. yeah. Like the, like that, like the char that pick, that you pick up off the barbecue. Right, exactly. It's like, mm, I just want to lick my lips. It's just, this would go <laughs> great with barbecue. This really would. Cause I mean, it would just totally match it. Oh yeah. Oh, it's so good. I'm going to, I'm, I'm saving one. Don't, don't worry. I'm saving one and I'll get my income tax hopefully in about a week or so. Definitely what's not fake news is, um, is autism. That's what we're going to hit up next. Autism is something I have to admit, I don't know a whole lot about. I've looked, I've been looking into it more over the past year or so mm -hmm. because it, it's very concerning. And I still have so many questions as to how this affects all kinds of, all kinds of communities. The, the technical the technical definition is a mental condition present from early childhood characterized by difficulty in communicating and forming relationships with other people in using language and abstract concepts. Mm -hmm. This can have any range of effects from um, being too stimulated by by input coming in. Visual input or audio input may make somebody just go, oh my God, I can't can't deal with the world. Mm -hmm. It can all go all the way to um, to somebody who is completely nonverbal. They can't communicate their their wishes, their desires, their needs. It's a problem for them. But a lot of the conflict comes in how we're looking at autistic people and their place in society. One of the conflicts I've seen is is autism speaks. Have you have you seen autism speaks? I have. I don't know if you know about the conflict with them. I don't. When they started, when they started out, I think it started out as a good idea. Okay, okay. we're going to we're going to be an advocate for people who are autistic, who are autistic. But they started putting people on the panels that were more business oriented. Ooh, and even even, to, even today, even today they have um the CEO is Angela Geiger mm -hmm. and the chief field officer is Anne Marie Forbes. And while these are fantastic business people, they have very little interaction with those who are actually autistic. These there's there is no autistic representative on the leadership board. That's not good. For for people who say autism speaks, mm -hmm. it's really concerning. And this this came to a head in 2013 okay. when people really lashed out really lashed out at Autism Speaks because it, it appeared that they were making money off it. Instead, of, instead of just being a nonprofit, it looked like they were actually attempting to make money off it. That is horrible. With, with untold amounts of money going to, you know, um, chief executive officers and, and things like that. How does autism help? What do you think of the actual condition itself? It's, it's so confusing, isn't it? Well, there's a spectrum, and one of the um, quotes that I've heard before that I found again in one of the articles is, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And what that means is it's different in everyone. And, and it is a spectrum because in the 90s, I had a friend who was a caretaker for people with severe autism. What I noticed with some of these people is they, they were nonverbal. They didn't speak 
in words. They would verbalize just at yelling, you know, just they would make sounds, but they never made actual words. This was severe autism, and that's why these people had to be cared for in a home. And they would be quick to anger. They, um, they would lash out. It would be violent. I mean, I have another friend now, now who also does the same sort of thing. So there is that part of the illness, but then there's a whole nother spectrum. You have also people who um, fall more under Asperger's who are able to express themselves verbally. They're able to go to work, able to, you know, interact with people, but they do have social issues, some physical in issues, maybe some mental issues. There are um, problems there that do need to be addressed. It's also part of who they are. And so when people do talk about a cure for autism, some people get a little wrinkled because they're like, I'm okay. I just want people to accept me. So I understand that. Now, as far as the more um, advanced cases, like what I was talking about, I, it would be nice if we could get to a point where we could figure out what is happening in these people's brains to do this and maybe um, lessen the effects. Maybe there won't ever be a cure, but if we could do some sort of therapy maybe to help people verbalize a little bit more and be able to interact, that would be nice. So do you know, what is the difference between Asperger's and autism? Is there really a difference? Well, Asperger's used to be its own um, clinical um, diagnosis. It used to not be on the spectrum, but now they put it on the spectrum with, as with autism. And basically, I guess you could call it higher functioning autism. I don't want to put words in the, in the mouth because I only know like from articles I've read and people I've met. So I don't, I'm no expert and I could be wrong. So if I'm wrong, please tell me. But it seems to me to be on the higher end because for the most part, these are people who do work. Um, they do function. They just maybe don't quite fit in with other people. Um, maybe they don't quite know how to carry a conversation the way other people might. Uh, there's actually um, uh, one of the articles I put has it's a checklist for specifically women with autism. And to me, it seems more like the Asperger's end of it. But the whole checklist, it's, it's really long. I think some of them repeat, but I can kind of go through some of them. Sure. The ones that I didn't think were repetitive. I and this list is from https colon slash slash everyday aspie and that's spelled A S P I E, which is a, a short name, a, a, a nickname for Asper people with Asperger's dot wordpress dot com and it's a whole long URL, but it's the the Asperger syndrome checklist is by Samantha Kraft. And she's written some books and spoken on the subject. Her list is really long, and I really feel like some of them are repetitive, and some of them maybe aren't, um, I wouldn't call them symptoms. I would call them just maybe more of a personality trait, which can kind of, you know, mesh together because having Asperger's is part of someone's personality. It's a big part of it. But some of the things that she said, um, innocent, tend not to lie and you have trouble discerning when other people are lying. Uh, you don't understand, you're not capable of manipulating people and um, you don't really understand if someone's trying to manipulate you. You just don't get those small social cues, like maybe the body language cues and things like that. And once again, everyone's different. Some people may be great with this and still be on the autism spectrum. Um, another thing is feelings of confusion and being overwhelmed, obsessive compulsive disorder, sensory issues. One thing that I do a lot, flicks, rubs fingernails, picks scalp skin, flaps hands, rubs hands together, tucks hands under or between legs, keeps closed fists, paces in circles, and her clear stud often. I am always flicking my fingers. I always have like little wounds on my fingers because I pick at them, pick at my face, I pick at everything. Now as far as flapping hand and hands and rubbing hands together, 
Um, some of the people I've witnessed with um, more of the extreme autism, they do tend to kind of flat their hands like this and maybe like raise their hands up, almost childish type behavior. You might overshare. Everyone knows I do that. You know, too much information. You don't know where that filter is. You don't know where the line is. You just go for it. You tell everybody everything. Whereas some people may not tell anyone anything. They may just shut down emotionally and not share with people. Um, some people might monopolize the conversation. Other people like me, I don't often know when it's my turn to speak. I'll kind of sit here looking at someone and then they'll look at me like, okay, I said what I'm going to say, now it's your turn. And I'm like, oh, but I've gotten better about that now. Because one of the things with me is I was always taught don't interrupt people, always taught that. So I don't interrupt people. I let them talk until they stop talking. But I've realized recently, just like within the last few years, that sometimes people talk, but they trail off expecting you to pick up what they're talking about and continue. So I always felt guilty because, in a sense, I'm interrupting them because they haven't finished their sentence, but I'm realizing now that they don't expect that they're going to finish their sentence. They're waiting for me to comment. So I've learned that it's okay to pick up. If someone has, says half a sentence, it's okay to pick it up if I know what they're going to say. So it's just one of those things that's like missing a handbook. That's how I felt. I've heard people describe it. It's like you're missing a handbook that other people have. So a, a lot of different things like that. Um, you're uncomfortable in public or in bathrooms in any sort of um, vulnerable position, you're uncomfortable. And, and you can say a lot of people are that way, not just people on the autism spectrum. So a lot of these things on the checklist could apply to a lot of people. Doesn't necessarily mean they're on the autism spectrum. Some of the things definitely though, I do feel like, you know, especially with the pacing back and forth, rubbing hands together, flapping hands. That's definitely something I've seen with people with autism. So there are just so many possible ways that autism can present itself. It's weird because I feel like some of these items might apply to me, but that's more because I have post-traumatic stress disorder than right. than any than any part on the autism spectrum. But I'm starting to wonder if maybe some people with um, some portion of the autism spectrum are not necessarily autistic. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be a that just happens to be a different part of being human. So is is autism becoming part of just becoming a human being or should we are we really supposed to be concentrating on like a preventative or because a cure would definitely change somebody who's autistic. Mm -hmm. That would change their personality and I would not want that. I don't no, want to change somebody's either. personality. So I agree, a cure is the wrong thing to be looking at. Right. This isn't this isn't measles we're looking at. This is somebody who looks who literally looks and interprets the way the world in a different way. I'm not even sure a preventative is is a good is a good thing to be looking at because again, you're changing the way somebody might look at the world and that might be unique to them. Mhm. Mm once again, it's someone imposing their view of the world onto someone else, saying, you're not normal, you need to be more like me. Yeah, even before they're born, we know for a fact, mm -hmm. there is scientific evidence, autism is not caused by vaccinations. If you're still believing that, you need to go back to science class. Yeah. It's not caused not caused by vaccinations. And I know Autism Speaks, um, Autism Speaks actually did insist on that until about 2013 when they abruptly changed their position. Oh. They're no longer looking for a cure either. Mm -hmm. They're looking for um, support. And for, that's great. Which is good. It's, it's good that, um, you know, that a, a, a entity like Autism Speaks can change like that and look for things that are more important to people on the autism spectrum. What I personally know of autism, we used to have, um, we used to have a young man living across the street from us. Yeah. And he was completely nonverbal. 
he could not take care of himself. His mom stayed still taking care of him. He was, he's, he's very polite in every other way. You know, he'd, he'd walk near you, but he felt very uncomfortable coming close to somebody he wasn't used to. And that's also a sign. Yeah. So, you know, when I'd visit, I'd say, oh, hi, but that was about it. If he felt like coming over to me, that was fine. He made specific noises that you could hear outside the house. After a while, you start to understand the quality of those noises and the messages they okay. represent. I knew when he was happy. I knew when okay. he was upset. I knew when something when something was so bad, it, it kind of made me, maybe I should go over and say hello. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, so autistic people do have messages in the sounds they make. If you pay It's communication, yeah. It is communication. You just have to be patient. You have to mm -hmm. listen. You have to pay attention and, um, and wait to see what those messages are. And learn their personality. Exactly. Learn their personality. Now, I, I know there are, there are a few autistic people that have worked at my local supermarket as well. And everyone in America may see this. Mm -hmm. If they're working, you know, in, um, in, at the end of the register, mm -hmm. they might bag your groceries. Right. Or they might bring your groceries out to the car. They may be mm -hmm. nonverbal. It doesn't mean that they're retarded or they're not people. No. no. If they don't talk to you, it's, it is perfectly okay to talk to them and thank them for the work they do, mm -hmm. even if they don't talk back. And be patient because sometimes they may take a little longer doing the groceries because maybe they want to make sure it's all stacked correctly. Or, I mean, there are just different reasons why it, they may not work at the speed you want them to or do things exactly the way you want them to. I just urge people to be patient don't bring attention to it. Don't call attention to it. If it takes them a little longer to do something, just have some forgiveness and say thank you. You know, that's that's all you have to do. Um, I know we have some people, well, I suspect that they're autistic. Um, my mother rides the um, sort of the, how do you put this, um, the bus for people who um, are physically or mentally unable to drive for themselves. Yes, yeah, we have a bus like that here too, yes. My mother rides it, and I ride it with her because I'm her companion. And I remember one time there was somebody on the bus, and I was looking at her, and I was like, you look so familiar. Why do you look so familiar? I didn't say it, but I was thinking that. And, you know, he was verbal. He was talking and stuff, but I could tell he was probably um, higher-functioning autism. Just things he would do, like he didn't have many expressions. He really just had one expression. And he would kind of bounce his head when he was talking and kind of dip to one side with his head. I could just, little cues that I kind of picked up on. I was like, he looks familiar. Well, next thing I know, we're pulling up to the grocery store that I go to almost every day, and he gets out. And I'm like, duh. Of course I know him. He bags my groceries. I felt so silly when I put it together, but, you know, you don't think you associate people with where you see them, so I always associated him with a grocery store. So when I see him outside that environment, it throws me off. Yeah. I've seen documentaries. I have not encountered this in person, but I have seen in documentaries uh, people working in other more professional positions, in offices, in mm -hmm. schools. Sometimes it takes a little bit of sometimes it takes a little bit of patience because the input coming in can be too much. So if they say, "Give me a second, just just give them a few minutes, just just walk away and come back in a little while," because the input can be can be really irritating to to ears or the way they're interpreting it. Um, I've heard. And I'm not sure if this is actually correct. I've heard that sometimes what they hear comes at them more than once. I can That's see that, like, like an echo? Like It's like an echo. They think about it, and it goes in their brain more again and again and again, and it's really hard to think about, especially in high-pressure situations. 
doesn't mean they can't solve the problem. It just means that they need to work through that particular input in order to get past it. Right, like the, what I read, um, sensory input, sometimes they have too much coming at once. They can't differentiate. I think this is a big thing. The inability to differentiate between different noises and different colors and sights coming at you. Um, one of the things on the checklist was you can't filter out background noise. So whereas some people may be able to hold a conversation and not worry about the traffic outside or the alarm going off, people with autism, you know, they hear, not all, but some may hear the traffic just as loudly as you speaking to them. It's all trying to divvy their attention and they can't. They can't just focus on one thing. Whereas other, in other cases, when they're alone, they can probably focus very well on one thing. It's just when there's so much input, they just can't block it out. If you're in Oregon, I don't know if other states have this. If you're in Oregon and um, you have a child with autism mm -hmm. uh, that needs a little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra patience. Um, consider joining, uh, consider putting your child in what's called an IEP program. The IEP program will give a child unlimited time for a test. That's um, good. It will allow them to walk out of a classroom if they feel overwhelmed into good. what's called a quiet room. Good. So they can just they can just be away for those few minutes it takes to collect themselves and work through all that the, the stimulation and then come back. There are other there are other items on the IEP list that um, will be between you and the school, but do do consider it if you're in Oregon. I, I don't know if I don't know what other states have I don't know. Uh, to equal this. But I mean it's not just children also. There are adults with autism. And as far as the um, the higher end of the spectrum, it can be hard to get diagnosed because some people learn to get along and they get branded with, you know, titles like weird, um, different, you know, odd, you know, you don't want to be around her. She smells weird. Uh, anyways, nothing personal or anything, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I understand. I mean, there there are several adults. Um, you know, and if an adult is autistic and they don't feel like talking about it, mm -hmm. that's not something that we should pressure them. And it's certainly, oh, for goodness sake, please don't turn around to say somebody and say, oh, what are you, autistic or something? Yeah, don't do that. People don't like that. That's, that's just not, not. That's not cool at all. That's hurtful for the people who do have that, you know, that, that designation. It is horrible. And Cybernaut's been commenting. Um, he said quite a few things that are very good, and so has Che. Um, one of the things that Cybernaut says, the diagnosis of Asperger's versus autism relies on checking a set of boxes, as they are both parts of the same spectral disorder. You can have a foot in each diagnosis, so you can be both autistic and have Asperger's. So, um, and he, he also said the brain is always evolving, and he talks about Temple Grandin. Um, Temple Grandin is a pretty well-known, I think she was a veterinarian, if I remember correctly. But I first learned about her when there was an HBO special about her, like a, a dramatization, dramatization of her life. And Cybernaut said that when she was a child, she was nonverbal. She was autistic. And when she was older, she became outspoken and articulate and a leader in her field of study. So it just goes to show that, that you can evolve. Even if you start off nonverbal, you can learn to open up, learn to interact with people. I'm sure it takes therapy. It takes a lot of patience and teaching. So, and I would like it if, you know, organizations like Autism Speaks focuses more on that. Not necessarily a cure, but maybe helping um, people cope. I don't know if that's the right word, but help, helping people become what they want to be. Not necessarily. Well, it's not, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's just, it may, it's not just for people who are autistic to help cope. Yeah. But also uh, people who are not autistic, people like me, it can be very difficult 
because I'm I'm very I I do rely on body cues a lot. Yeah. So when I you know when I hesitate, I expect like you said, I expect people mm -hmm. to talk back, and when they don't, I get confused. So it's if you if you don't know what to expect, if you feel uncomfortable, it's okay to look into it. It's okay yeah. to you know to look into you know what happens when what happens when and uh, when you're speaking with a person who has autism, mm -hmm. what to expect and how, when to be patient and when to say something, or when to push them a little bit. You know, like you know, don't you want to go out? Because they may say, I don't want to go. I don't want to be around people. Well, you might say, Oh, it's a nice day. You haven't been out of the house in a few days. Why don't we go to the park? There won't be many people there, or you know, if you start to feel uncomfortable, we can leave, things like that. Yeah, giving options, and um, people with autism can be just as good a friend as anybody you consider to be, quote-unquote, normal. <laughs> and, I mean, once autism, again, we can't... Autism, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Lola, sorry. Well, sorry, right. I was going to say, once again, you know, we can't put everyone in the same bracket, but I do feel like that people with autism, autism like symptoms may be more loyal because when, you know, when someone has been sort of marginalized their whole lives, when they find someone they like who they get along with, they might latch on, you know, I mean, it, it, it may be the case of, okay, Lola, go, go find another friend to play with, but I like you, I want to play with you. So, you know, they can be more loyal. They, they, can be awesome friends. It's a difficult subject, mm -hmm. especially when we have a lot of people telling us that um, a lot of people telling us that autistic people should only be doing specific jobs in 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 society. When that's not true at all, no. it is autism has a huge range, mm -hmm. and there's no telling what an autistic what a person with autism wants to do or can do that only they can tell you that only they can say I can do this that's not our job to say you you know you can't do that you should you you know you should be bagging groceries when this person is perfectly capable of managing a store on their own or you can't go to college you know telling yes. them you can't go to college well and a lot of that comes from early age development giving them the space they need to develop in their own way instead of trying to pigeonhole them into, you know, a seven hour school day and, you know, you have to get your test done at this point. And instead of making it rigid, kind of loosen it up so that they can develop. That's the thing. Not everyone develops the same. And when you have one size fits all schools, you end up with a lot of people who are left out on the fringe. Now, I, I have a question since I, I know, I think I saw this on the notes. Is it true that, that autism and Asperger's is a boy's disease? No, it's not. And that's the thing. A lot of people treat it like it's a boy's disease. They might look at a girl and say, you can't have autism. You're not a boy. It's for boys. Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, me personally, I, I truly believe I have Asperger's. I really deep in my heart believe I have Asperger's. And a lot of the things that I've experienced have been mirrored in some of the articles I've read. With me, I learn to assimilate. It's funny, as much as a rebel as I think I am, I do realize now there are places where I have attempted to assimilate, meaning I've learned to look people in the eyes, although I can't do it for a long period of time. I can look at a person for a minute or something, but then if I'm doing like a big swath of speech, I look down or I look to the side. I don't look at people when I'm like really giving a big talk, you know? I can only do it for a little bit, and plus I say, you know, like this stuff a lot. Um, and then I lose my train of thought. So, but I, I have pushed myself to mimic other people. It's almost like an acting job, which makes me exhausted. That's part of the reason why I'm so tired all the time. I don't do this with you for the most part. I mean, looking at, at people, that's something I've had to train myself to do. Uh, but for the most part, I, I am being myself with you, tr trying to be engaged 
sometimes when I'm having a conversation with someone, not you, but other people, inside my head I'm thinking, is this over yet? I'm really thinking that. Is this over yet? But I keep going because it's expected of me. I'm supposed to be social and I'm supposed to be happy, especially at work, because they cram it down our throats. Be happy, smile, interact, socialize, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Now this is where this is where I'm wondering how the autism spectrum and perhaps being being more internal like I am mm -hmm. coincide. I'm not hugely social. I, I mean, I pick one, two, maybe three places in a community, and I'm mm -hmm. willing to go there time after time after time. Like, a, I'll go to Beer 30. I'll go mm -hmm. to McMenamin. Um, I'm comfortable with going to, you know, with to Safeway. I know a few people there. Mm -hmm. um, anywhere else, it's really an acting job right. to get through. So where i'm wondering if you know if if some of these if some of these things are are meshing to become normal human behavior i don't some people say they thrive with new experiences i don't know they could be lying for all i know but there are people who say oh i love going new places i love meeting new people and i love feeling on the edge and uncomfortable i am the opposite and i'm going to tell you right now i hate new places I hate new people. I hate feeling on the edge. I hate being uncomfortable. I like being at home. I like talking to people I know. And that's me, and I accept it. People try to change that. Oh, Lola, why don't you come out of your comfort zone? Come skate. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. And I've had to learn to put my foot down and say, I don't want to. I want to stay home and watch sci-fi all day. That's what I want to do. I am an adult, dang it, and I'm going to throw a tantrum because I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. And if I don't want to do it, I don't have to do it. Let's do the comics because it's kind of fresh on our minds. And okay. I know that Che has some images for us. So, all right. So tonight we're going to talk about comics that are either based in British or done by British people. And I myself, I don't know that many, not as many as I would like. But, I mean, I know some of the iconic ones. But before I talk about mine, why don't you talk about yours? Okay. I actually only picked one because one was all I could afford this month. But okay. man, man, did I pick one I really love. And I actually got the book itself. So that mm -hmm. gives me a range of actual comics to go through. So I'm reading uh -huh. a little bit every day. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually called, and I better get this right, or our producer is just going to like eat me for breakfast. It's called Salina. Sounds good to me. <laughs> when you see it, it's actually spelled S L um, accented A I N E. It is not slain. <laughs> this is, I believe, this is an Irish word. It looks like it. And uh, this comic is actually detailing the life of Salina McRoth. He's a mm -hmm. barbarian, and he has like mystic earth powers. Mm -hmm. that allow him to um, go into a, he activates what are called warp spasms. Okay. So he turns into this berserker with, you know, incredible strength and feats of strength and able to fight really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, it it's really res reminiscent of Conan. Mm -hmm. And I thoroughly enjoyed watching and reading about Conan. So, okay. And and the very first few comics go into his, you know, go into his life. He's actually super young. Like he's I don't I don't even think he's like nineteen yet. Oh. I think he's like seventeen or something. Okay. And, uh, his this really young guy has spent like all of his life training to be a warrior. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, um he gets caught with the chief's daughter oh no wah, wah. and he gets pitched out on his ear start his new tribe yeah well yeah and then he's he's got to go out and you know he's walking the world and he joins up with this this little troll like fellow ah. and he almost reminds you of uh, uh lord of the rings uh 
Um, the dwarves? Gollum. Gollum. Oh, <laughs> no. Gollum. Oh, no. He's, Gollum. he's incredibly humorous. Okay. He's got a, a lovely sense of humor. Okay. But ugly, great sense of humor, and quick as a whip when it comes to money. Oh, we can make money doing this. And, you know, if you go and, you know, have a warp spasm, you know, and pick up a horse with your legs, people pay money to see that. So in so, order to make him, in order to make Salina have a warp spasm, he stands on a tree branch and insults him until Salina <sighs> gets angry enough to have a warp spasm. Oh my God. And <laughs> lifts this horse with his legs. Wow. So he's like a coach in the corner. Come on, you yeah. can do it, Sadie. You can do it. Now the artwork is in, the artwork that I've seen is pretty much black and white. Okay. But it's so it's 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 so like classic line drawing mm -hmm. um and sketch artist mm -hmm. that it's it's absolutely gorgeous to me. Okay. I don't know if, if like the later versions will change or have color, uh, because these are very early versions. Oh, okay. But I, I really thoroughly enjoy the story if, if you like like a Conan like yeah. adventure type fantasy. story. Fantasy. You will very much enjoy this comic. Very, very much. And, and so it how comes... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you're probably going to answer my question. Like, um, how old is it? How many um, volumes are there? Um, okay, in, now I got, uh, I got it directly. This is weird because um, Comixology is owned by Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, and you can get Warrior's Dawn on Amazon. I know. But you can't get it on Comic Solid. Doesn't make sense. And I found out the hard way that what you buy on Amazon Sun doesn't translate to Comicsology and vice versa. Now, if you get if you get this on if you get this on the original site, which is uh, shop two thousand ad dot com. Okay. And I put the link in our show notes. Okay. Uh, if you get it from the original site, if you get a CBZ, mm -hmm. okay, you can actually use that. I um in in a comic app now i i got what's called uh, m comics m c o m i x totally okay free, totally free you know the app there. or the comic itself the, the app, app. Okay. the app is called yeah the app is called m comics okay warriors dawn cost me i believe for um for the book it cost me 12 dollars not too bad. But the book itself includes the Time Monster, the Beast in the Brook, okay. Warrior's Dawn, the Beltane Giant, Bride of Krom, the Creeping Death, the Bull Dance, Hero's Blood, the Shoggy. That's a lot. And Sky Chariots. That's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. And I'm only mm -hmm. to the Beltane Giant. I've yeah. been reading this every morning with my coffee every morning. Yeah, and I'm only to there. It's it, been like half the month. <laughs> it it takes me time to get through comics because I'm old and I have to read them like this. Oh. Pretend this is my Kindle. Right. I have to go. What's that say? I can't say it. Claire, what's this say? Can you can you read it? What is it? Who is that? I can't tell who that is. Woo! We need so. to get you a giant screen and then Google can read it to you. I, I guess so. I don't know. I'm on my Kindle. I'm like, I can't. And I even have one pane up at a time, and I'm still like, I can't see it. What are they talking about? Clint, what are they talking uh, you know, about? You know what I would love? I would love to, to have a VR uh, a VR comic reader. That would be cool. Because then I could just set it inside the VR, yeah, inside the VR helmet. I could set it how as big as I need it to be. That would be great. You can see the Doctor Who over here, and then... The TARDIS over here, and just oh, every pain would jump out at you. You'd be like, oh, 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 oh. that's the beauty of that's the beauty of comics is that you can take as long as you like to look at the artwork, right? And read just a little bit at a time, and mm -hmm. really get into the scene. 
Yes, Fantastic. gorgeous. Especially with some of the old Gothic type um, things. And, and as a segue, I'll take that. Um, Lady Mechanica. That's one of those that the artwork is gorgeous. Uh, it's, it's sort of a steampunk type, you know, old uh, Victorian or something. But it's just gorgeous. And like, I only have the one comic. But let me Related see. Mechanica. Now, uh, now, I've been wanting to actually read Lady Mechanica. But it's good. I have this need to finish, you know, I reading. Know. And finish reading what I have. But, man, oh, look, the, the colors on there. It's so steampunky. And the grays, all these blue-gray colors. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And like the font now does that font continue inside the book inside the the comic or is it you know i should have brought up comiXology i'm a moron let me see if i can bring up comiXology because i'm not i can't quite remember i might have downloaded it let me look and see if i downloaded it let me look and see if i downloaded it i don't know if i did got a variety of weapons doesn't she Yes, she does. She she has everything. Um, she's part robot. Her deal she is mm -hmm. really oh, yeah. that's pretty cool. Her her deal is that she was part of an experiment, <clears throat> and she's the last remaining person from the experiment. And everyone in Victorian, I think it's London, knows that she's this basic freak. And so she has to live this like <clears throat> Frankenstein's monster type life where, you know, everyone fears her, but, you know, they need her because she helps people. Yeah. And the one I read, she was like trying, she was fighting some kind of adversary and they didn't understand just how strong she was. And so she came out and, you know, she was doing her swords and everything and her fighting and then she left them as a pulp, and she was like, don't you come back here. So it's like its own mini story. And, but it's just awesome. See, mm -hmm. That is what happens when you underestimate a woman. Exactly. Especially a woman who is partially, you know, um, non-biotic. That's right. She is awesome. I love her. And she's kind of got this Tomb Raider look. I mean, she, it's the classic her breasts are way bigger than her waist. So, well, I mean, as long as there's a storyline, I there. think I can forgive, you know, the, you know, the exposed midriff and <laughs> I can too. And I mean, you know, if I were an artist and I were drawing something like that, I would probably maybe want to make her look like that too. So, if I'm drawing a man, Dude, would I rather draw a pudgy Donald Trump looking guy or Arrow? Yeah. I'd, ra I'd rather draw Arrow. Or so, Luke Cage. Or Luke Cage, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to keep it in perspective. It's like they draw what they want. But I'm uh, I'm on the guy's website, Joe Benitez. Um, his last name is B-E-N-I-T-E-Z, and the first name is J-O-E. So it's JoeBenitez.com. And I'm seeing the description of the comics and, and the images. They're gorgeous. Now, I don't know if the guy is English, but I picked it because it takes place in England. So I figured, you know, it's still got the sort of foggy London, you know, vibe and everything. And it looks like some of it looks like some of the actual art covers are very like um, De Los Muertes. Well, yeah, sort of that Mexican Day of the Dead type thing. So there's probably... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very intricate. Definitely. And I'm on his website, and he says he is American-born, but I would imagine probably um, South American-inspired or Central American-inspired. Um, but, yeah, it's gorgeous artwork. I'm not sure if he does the artwork or someone else does. I should have done a little bit more research. It says free downloads, though. I'd like to see what these free downloads. Oh, another thing is he owns it. The website says it's a creator-owned comic book series. Oh, I like that. I know. So I love indie. 
right and, and and well known he's you know he made it he's all of our dreams he made it you know mr hard worker you've impressed me right um and the description says um she's been dubbed lady mechanica by the tabloids she's the sole survivor of a mad scientific horrific experiments which left her with mechanical limbs having no memory of her captivity or her former life Mechanica eventually built a new life for herself as a private detective. Have I mentioned I love private detective stuff? Oh. Gumshoe. So it's Gumshoe meets Steampunk. Yes. How cool is that's, that? That's really excellent. I like that a lot. Definitely going to look into that one after I finish uh, Salina. Yeah. So um, hopefully we can, you know, it, there are a lot of them. So it may take some money and time before we can read all of them. But maybe once we've read more of them, we can revisit them. Well, I'll have um, to look and see if he has, you know, um, like conglomeration. I love books with like, you know, like half a dozen or whatever books all in one. I do too. I like the graphic novels. Um, the only thing I miss with the graphic novels is you don't get the, um, the letters from fans. That's the only thing I miss. But for the most part, I tend to get Nowadays, I get digital. I used to get the actual physical books, but I tend to get the compilations because it's usually a little cheaper and it's easier. I just have yeah. it all there. I think He's the a, last time I actually bought a physical comic, it, it was um, Mad Magazine. That was a while ago. Huh? <laughs> that was a while ago. Yeah, I can't think of the last time. We used to go, I feel bad because we used to go to a comic book store here in Jacksonville. And, you know, we would buy tons of comics, but I'm sorry the digital age happened. And if I had a car, I might be more likely to go to a physical store, but I don't have a car. So it would take me three, two buses, two buses to get there when I can just go into comiXology and have it. Yeah, yeah, that's, it can get, that gets really painful. And even, you know, even when, even if we really want the physical book, mm -hmm. you know, we tend to order it and have it delivered. We can, yeah, we can still order it. I mean, if we want the physical book, we can order it and I don't have to go to a store. Yeah. I don't have to wait in line. I mean, I, I want to be able to take all my reading material with me. I don't want to ever lose anything again, which is why I love digital comics. Love digital comics. This is episode 32. This is section episode 32. 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 So yeah, Yay! we're drinking beer, having fun on a Sunday. Um, I'm gonna pop up my second one real quick. Go ahead. Uh, this is actually one I tried yesterday and found super fascinating. Mm -hmm. We wait all year for Fort George to do what they call their three-way. Oh. It's, it's a collaboration between three breweries. Oh, okay. And this time it's between Fort George, Great Notion. I gotta look again. Uh, Rubens Brews. Never heard of them. And I knew it wasn't this one because this one is actually <laughs> very bright and wow. very yeah, uh, very unfiltered. I've never seen that color in a beer. That's it's all very unfiltered. unfiltered. It looks almost like you know, like orange pulp, doesn't it? Yes, or lemonade pulp, because it's almost a lemon color, or mango pulp. It looks like mango pulp. Mango pulp. pulp, pulp, pulp. Mang mangled, mangled, mangled pulp. Mangled pulp. What does it taste like? That actually looks like the stuff you get like from the bright tube or something. It, it's, it's absolutely fascinating because the flavor changes from one sip to another. Wow. Like right now, like right now I'm getting like orange. Uh -huh. If I wait a little bit and drink it again, I might get pineapple, mango, coconut. There's a little bit of hoppiness at the back of my tongue. Okay. But it's such an interesting beer, and it's and it's not it's not got the typical texture of an IPA. Mhm. Mm it's thick. It's thick like like a pulpy 
orange juice almost yeah, that, that looks kind of like, thing. Yeah, viscous. Like like you have actual bits in there. Are yes. there actual bits? It, yeah. It, almost it, if there were actual bits in there, I would believe it. Well, if it's unfiltered, there probably are actual bits. It's mm, it is super delicious. Wow. And tell me again what it is. It's called three way. <laughs> I didn't yeah. mean it. Yeah, they did. They did that on purpose. I know they did. I'm trying so hard not to laugh. I'm just. <laughs> I'm oh, and uh, another interesting thing is that uh, they're they're not calling this, you know, like the normal IPAs, like an English IPA or a Northwest IPA. They call it a Northeast IPA. Today, we are going to talk about some LGBT issues because it's Gay Pride Month, and, and every month should be Gay Pride Month, but this month specifically, we're looking a little deeper into some of the issues. And we are actually here with one of my in real life friends, T, and uh, we're going to talk about some issues that affect him deeply. Now, we actually had some topics to talk about, but since we have you here, T, I kind of like for you to run the show um, because you have a lot to offer us that we we don't know. We're two mostly straight women. We, we have no clue. We like to think maybe we know stuff, but we probably don't. So if you don't mind, I'd like for you to talk about just kind of your life, your experiences, um, when and wow. That's a broad could you word. could you please sum up your life in in you know <laughs> not to put you on the spot or anything? Well, okay. okay. So. so let's like well, I guess we could start with you know just who you are and. Okay. Well, I'm T. Ferret. Mm -hmm. I am the current Mr. South Coast Olympus Leather for 2016-2017. Nice. nice. I am a pagan priest. I am an nice. activist. I volunteer in the community, do community outreach, and I'm transitioning from, you know, I was assigned female at birth, and I'm transitioning to male, mm -hmm. and I'm pansexual, so yeah. everyone's hot. And, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. And I've been, you know, fighting against Nazis, KKK. KK gay and all the other people. <laughs> never uh, heard the term KK uh, gay. I, like that. I, KK, I have never heard that either. The KK gay are the um, white cisgender gays. They're mostly rich. They're racist. They're the yeah. gay racists. They think they can get a leg up by being jerks to people of color. They're basically passing. Basically, yeah, they, because they're white. Yeah. And we, you know, we there is a problem with that in the gay community right now. They don't like a lot of people don't want to acknowledge their white privilege and how it affords them certain things. Or, you know, especially the more, um, you know, rich gays always organizing events, and the poor gays they're like, okay, how are we going to afford all this? Well, fuck mm -hmm. you guys. Like, <laughs> that's basically their attitude. And it's like, nope, that's not right. If if you're white, one of the unfortunate things is. If if you're black, you can't hide it. If you're um, must, if you're okay, if you're from the Middle East, you generally can't hide it. But if you're gay and you're white, you can pass. You can go into what people might consider polite society and be fine. But a lot of people don't have that privilege. They can't pass. They can't blend in, it, no matter where they are. And so I think some people who maybe can blend in don't understand what it's like to be someone who can't. Well, and they go on and they ignore, you know, they ape heteronormative behavior like, mm -hmm. oh, we have our rights now because we have gay marriage, but what about mm -hmm. trans people, what about bisexual people? Because they always end up erasing bisexual people and pansexual people because of, you know, who they're partnered with and their identities. And it's just a lot of microaggressions that pile up because they don't want to acknowledge their privilege. And so, yeah, that's been a little bit of a hot button issue. Mm -hmm. And we still have some states, I don't know if, if it's really as true as it was when I was growing up, but there's still some states where there are sodomy laws on the books. So, yeah, yeah, they try to um, police up stings and try to arrest people mm -hmm. on the blue laws. 
And you know what? If you're a rich gay, you can get out of it. I'm sorry. It's true. You can get out of it. Whereas people... Or if your family can't. has connections, too. Some of the rich people, they have connections, so... How does your the, the transitioning fit into um, having trouble actually forming the question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm trying hard not to sound like, and this is our token transsexual friend, T. Oh, Hi, everyone. <laughs> Everyone meet our token transsexual friend, T. So I'm trying very hard not to sound like that. I'm like, uh, uh, we have so many questions, but we sound like morons. Uh, what's it like? Go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, never going, I'm never going to know what it feels like because I've accepted, you know. I've, I've, yes, yeah. I've accepted that I'm a girl. I, I feel pretty good as a girl. Yeah, that's that's. That's who I well, am. And, and you were lucky in that you were born the way you were meant to be. Some people yeah, feel they like weren't. I was, the way I was meant to be. Yeah. Uh, I've never had a person look at me, you know, and, and have that reaction of you. Yeah. Should you be here? What Are you a boy? Are you a girl? What are you? Oh, I get that. I used to get that a lot. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I'm passing a little bit more these days, but, you know, I felt... You know, something was off because I always felt like I was a little boy when I was a kid. I was yeah. you know, brown with my shirt off, belt strap across my chest, you know, pretending to be Rambo. Yeah. And all of a sudden, puberty happened. I'm like, um, what the fuck's going uh -oh. on? Here? This isn't right. This so isn't right. The, <laughs> I drop the. Am I not allowed to drop the f bomb or? Oh, you can. Okay. Oh, totally allowed. Yeah. But yeah, it was like it just didn't. It was like puberty hit and like everything went wrong. Mm-hmm. So now I'm going through the process of correcting it. Mm -hmm. So do you feel those microaggressions because of the transitioning? Well, I mean, do, does it build up? I mean, do people do people do you know like little stuff that it's it's like difficult to tell, but you know is an aggressiveness. Little slights. Little yeah. slights. Well, I mean, it's like oh, you know, you know, some people have told me well. We can't date if you end up getting a penis. Um, we, you know, you know, um, we may, I thought you maybe looked better as, you know, when you're presenting as female. I mean, I've gotten, you know, then the aggressive um, misgendering with, you know, she, 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 and all that is. Sorry. It's not your fault. You're, 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 you at least acknowledge it. You're not going out and. No. No. It's just, but then, like, you know. Just little things like that here and there. But I notice as I progress in my transition, some of it lessens up. Do you find that it's maybe a little bit lessened because your name isn't an obviously gendered name? Does that help? Like T? Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, dude, Mr. T. Yeah. Yes. I'm Mr. T, yeah. That, that. That seems like it might be helpful. I mean, I'm talking out of my ass, but it seems like it might be helpful. I mean, at least your your name isn't Clarissa, so. No. <laughs> and then, well, then you would could go to Clark. I don't know where you would go from Clarissa. I have no idea. I'm glad I don't have that name. I'm how glad about, you don't. How about that. how about the people? How about the people who have a female name and want to keep it if they're transitioning to male? <laughs> I mean, that's up to them. A name is just a name. Yeah. Like, yeah. Name. Because, I mean, it's it's been drilled into us so many times, you know, you're supposed to, if you're a girl, you're supposed to have a girl's name, and you're supposed to dress a specific way. So then you have a female-to-male transition, and they say, well, I like the name Clarissa. I'm just going to keep it. And that's a decision, I guess. Huh? That, man, that would, that would, that would, but see, okay, but so there's a lot of difficult. names. There's a lot of names right now that in Victorian era and before. Ashley. Were, yeah, Ashley, Mallory, mm -hmm. Rachel. Mm -hmm. A lot of those names were male names. Yep. Then, Dana. And then, like, you know, but certain things happen with social restructuring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, blue was seen as a girl color because it was calming. Pinks mm -hmm. and reds were seen as male colors because of passion. Oh. And, you know, all the societal norms changed, and now we are with the clusterfuck we're at today. Mm -hmm. So. 
And I guess it comes down to how solid is your metal? Because you could keep the name Dana if, if you were assigned a female at birth and your name is Dana. You could say, you know what, Dana Carvey. It can be a male's name, and yeah. you could keep it, but the, I think the, the issue may be that it will call attention to your gender even more than you may want to. Well, then there's people like me that, um, because right now we're still in the process of transitioning, we still have our dead names on our legal documents because yeah. they want us to be free of debt and to remember all our previous addresses and all kinds of just random information to get our names changed. And then you have certain fees if you can't um, get a certain waiver, you're looking at at least $400 in legal fees just to get your name changed. That's ridiculous. And how, about, should, how about, oh, I'm sorry, Lola. Well, I was going to say that should be the easiest part, right? I mean, there's surgery and then having your name changed. The name change should be the easier part. No, they they still make you jump through hoops to get there. They do. How difficult is it? How difficult is it to get the gender changed on it, where where you are? I mean, is it absolutely impossible to get well, legal documents changed? You as you get on the note from your therapist or mm -hmm. a doctor saying you are transitioning, and then you get your name changed to male name, and then you know you bring in the letter with your name change documents, and they're supposed to change your gender marker for you, and you can. Um, the only problem you run into is if your birth date, if you weren't, um, if your birth date won't change your birth certificate. Oh. Because I know my birth date is Washington, and they, okay. you know, as long as I send off the documents to, um, I guess health and vital statistics, I, I can go ahead and get a new birth certificate and everything okay. made. So and they're cool. Get, yeah, but mm -hmm. a lot of other places, it, it varies state by state. Well, we've seen just here in Jacksonville how backwards Jacksonville is because when they, when the federal government finally legalized gay marriage, Jacksonville like shut down. <laughs> well, yeah, um, and that's why I was actually part of the um, the mass wedding, one of the awesome. officiants before at the mass wedding in Hemming Plaza once um, mm -hmm. gay marriage was legalized. Mm -hmm. I actually was one of the people performing weddings that day. Awesome, that Thank is you very much. fabulous. I know Oregon. Oregon is, has put um, has put forward the option to have you know non-binary as, wow. as the gender on you know driver's licenses and, nice. and um, federal like and and state IDs. Why are we not just getting rid of the gender the gender requirement altogether on on identification? Yeah. Why do we need it? Because they want to just be able to keep tabs on everybody and. It's it's really outdated. It is, especially with so many people actually, um, you know, saying I I don't feel the way I was born, and then it's all up to the way they look, and you can't tell what a person no. is or who a person is by how they look. No. So it, I mean, identification you can have identification completely wrong. The only way you'll know is if you strip the person and no one wants that no one wants that at a, at a police check please don't strip me please don't well mm -hmm. even then you know if they're still going through a transition or if they're yeah, trans, you're right one of the trans people that decide i'm not going to go on hormones mm -hmm. i just am this is how i feel you know because they can't afford to or whatever or they just don't want to go through it that's fine but you know you still wouldn't even figure it out then because gender is a social construct it's not what your body is physical and you're exactly. right um, i don't know what the terms are anymore but i i know people used to use the terms pre-op post-op is are those terms still used yep around certain circles yes they are okay are they but are they acceptable are they offensive not really they just are it just depends yeah. on what context people use them in well, and like you made, you made the point that there are some people who aren't going to go through with the surgery, and that's fine. They identify as a gender, but their physiology will always be different. So, and that's fine. That's their choice. Unfortunately, we don't have a word for it, and that's our fault. 
that's society's fault. We don't have a word for people who identify as a different gender but don't have the money or the inclination to have the surgery. And that, that's not anyone's fault but ours as a society. I've, I've heard slights, you know, uh, with regard to, you know, pre-op, post-op. Well, they're not, you know, they're not really transitioned. They're, yeah, they're only no. pre-op. Like, yeah. As if, as if somebody doesn't really mean it. As if they're not, you know, sincere in their in their gender equality to me. They, you know, oh, they're just messing around. They're not dedicating themselves. Well, Brenda is not the fucking gym. I mean, <laughs> Brenda, Jimothy, whoever the fuck says that shit. Uh huh. It's not, you know, it's not. Is ultimately no one else's business, right. but the person. Right. And that's that. I can't tell you. I mean, even I don't know you that well, T, but even if I did know you well, I can't tell you, you were born a female. You need to put yourself in that box now. I can't tell you that. I can't. Oh, I didn't mean yeah, put it yourself in that box. I would pepper spray you in a heartbeat if you said that. Right. Right. I can't tell you that. I am not you. I am not you. I can't tell you that, and I can't judge you for it, and I can't judge you for what level of transition you are in. You may just have realized that you are not in the correct body that you're supposed to be, and you're just starting to kind of feel your way around, starting to kind of experiment with maybe wearing different clothing or whatever. I can't tell you that you're not a true transsexual because you haven't taken the plunge and had the surgery yet. Oh, Corellitis says John Wayne asks if John Wayne's name was actually Mary. Was I it don't, John? Was I it John? Marion. Marion. I actually have heard that. That's. I think that's right. I've heard that before. John Wayne Marion Gacy or no? John Marion. Okay, now Wayne. you're getting confused you're with getting the serial killer. killer. <laughs> John Wayne. It's Wayne Talk Gacy, about misidentified. Well, John Wayne Gacy was in Marilyn Manson. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> mm. Yeah. John Wayne Gacy is a John serial Wayne the, killer. John Wayne the actor. Yeah. John Marion well, Wayne, or was it Marion? You know what? You know what? We we could take this opportunity for a teachable moment. John Wayne Gacy was supposedly named after John Wayne, and part of the reason maybe that he had so much aggression is that he was a gay man. And he was forced to fit into a, a straight man stereotype for so long. Well, so, it's like the to toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm, you have to do this. You right. have to do this. You have to, you know, shit bricks and eat fucking turtles and, yeah. you know, spit barbed wire to be a real man. And be John like Wayne. That. Yeah. And that kind of that's toxic really, masculinity. That's really that disturbing. Toxic. That thought mm -hmm. is really disturbing, you know, the, well, the whole toxic masculinity well, and then like, and like a lot, I see a lot of trans men um, falling prey to that, mm -hmm. and you know, going to the hyper masculinity and misogyny, mm. and even trans misogyny against you know transgender women, and I'm like, no, no. sit down, shut the fuck up, and no, no, don't do it. You're we're all family. Don't do it. Yeah. So what form? What forms to your activism? Does your activism take? Let me see. <laughs> Let me see. I fight against Nazis and white supremacists. I fight against um, conservative Christians. Mm -hmm. I help out the homeless when I can, and do um, help, do stuff for AIDS awareness. Uh, raise mm -hmm. money for people when they um, have a certain need come up, like uh, when Baton Rouge got flooded. I brought uh, donations out to them. When a friend of mine's um, fiance died, you know, I did a fundraiser to get stuff for help with funeral expenses and for her and the children and what have you. Um, I just go out and help where I'm needed, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I do what I can. That is wonderful. Uh, I'm just a very service-oriented person. You're uh, like an action-oriented person. Like, <laughs> we need more people I mean, like that. Like, um, last, this time last year, like um, this time last year, during when after you know in the wake of Pulse, I had just had my histo, oh. so I'm you know I you know as soon as you know that happened, I ended up going up to Hamburger Mary's and 
yeah. putting out a call to not, you know, to the community not to sink to Islamophobia because mm-hmm. during that time it was it was it happened during Ramadan, and mm-hmm. Muslims that had been fasting all day were out there standing in line for hours donating blood, and the ones who couldn't donate blood mm-hmm. were out there handing out drinks and stuff to people who were in line mm-hmm. donating blood. So it's like you know, this is an isolated you know it was an isolated you know terrorist incident. The real Muslims were out there helping gay people and banding together with them. So it's like, you know, I go where I need it. I, you know, it's, I, I guess it's like from growing up watching superheroes on TV, mm-hmm. like Adam West's Batman, oh, Christopher, R. Reeves, Adam West. Christopher Reeves as Superman, mm-hmm. Linda Carter as Wonder Woman, you know, mm-hmm. the Hulk. Spider-Man, all the, you know, late 60s or, you know, and 70s superhero stuff kind of, you know, shaped me to be, you know, I go out there, I do stuff, I, you know, I help people when I can. Mm-hmm. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take care of each other. Superheroes awesome. work. Score. Awesome. See, I, I say that all the time. Our superheroes, you know, that, that we, you know, we read these comics and we watch these shows as, as children. You know, I watched Wonder Woman and yeah. He Man and She Ra, and I'm still watching oh today. God, yeah. And you know, and yeah. you know, it it still inspires me to do. Now I don't do as much as you do, T. You're really impressive, but it does inspire me to actually, you know, attempt to do a little more. I I, mean, I tend to take on. I tend to I tend to try to take on some of the more direct backlashes by, um, you know, challenging, by reading books and recording them um, from LGBT authors about LGBT, um, about LGBT topics, reading them and and putting them out on YouTube. That's about the extent I can go to. (laughs) Unless it's an event in my community, I don't mind going out and doing an event in my community. Man, you have. I mean, everyone has certain abilities. Yeah. Everyone has certain abilities and limitations, and you have to go and do what you can within those abilities and limitations. Mm -hmm. Every superhero has their own powers and own unique weaknesses, and they have to go on and do things in those realms. Mm -hmm. And and we all. We, we all judge what we can do. I mean, if, if you know for some reason you can't do something, there's no reason to feel ashamed. There's probably a good reason. Like, I, God help me, work for a government contractor. God help me. So there's stuff I can't do. One day, I plan to, to be in a place where I can do more. But right now, I can't. But... I, I can do things, I can do what I can do, and I can push as hard as I can push. And and I'm very grateful for people like you, T, who are, excuse the phrase, balls to the walls. You, you know, you, you are no holds barred. You are out there, and you are probably braver than I am. You probably have more metal than I do. And I think everyone is grateful that we have people like you. I'd like to ask a, a question about um, now confrontation in communities. Is it is it acceptable or not to step up for a friend who is or anybody in the community who is being harassed, or is it actually kind of um, you know pushing them to the background? Should we allow them to speak up for themselves or? I mean, is it okay for me as a cisgendered woman to, to step up and say, you know what, that's just an, an asshole maneuver. You need to, you know, cut this out. Or is it better that I allow that person to speak for themselves? It really depends on the situation and the factors going into it because you have some people that will not listen to transgender people no matter what unless an ally steps in. But the boundary is when you think that your experience trumps the tr- yeah. you know, what trans people are feeling, and we have cisgender people dictating to trans people of color 
how they should feel about a certain situation. That's where the line is crossed. You, no one gets to tell me how I feel about a situation. Yeah. You can speak up for me. You can be my ally, but you don't tell me how I should feel about something. I, that's one thing I would never do. If I'm in a situation where I see someone being bullied or being hurt, I will step in to the best of my ability, and I would take a punch to keep someone else from taking a punch. But I will not tell them what they should be feeling or thinking. I will always allow the other person to speak for themselves. Yeah, I've, I've heard from, I've heard differing opinions. Um, you know, I, I understand I want, I want somebody to have the power on their own, you know, to, to tell other people off. But there have been some situations where it, it was obvious that they yeah. were not going to be able to take that initiative. Yeah. And I stepped in. And, and sometimes it makes me wonder whether I was right to do that or wrong to do that. If Sometimes, though, if someone has been a victim of bullying and abuse, mm -hmm. they don't know how to step up. Right. So you got to read it as a situational thing. Mm -hmm. you can't, there's always nuances and gray areas because, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's not always black and white. It's not always mm -hmm. clear cut. A good example, Linda, you're in Oregon, and I'm sorry, I didn't introduce y'all because I stuck as a host. Um, T, this is Linda. She's in Corvallis, Oregon. Linda, this is T. He is in Jacksonville, Florida. It's so nice uh, to meet you. Linda, you are in Oregon, and we had a situation just a few weeks ago where two, or one Muslim girl, the other girl, I don't even think she was Muslim, but two girls who... No, she was a uh, woman of color. Woman of color. All right. Two, two girls who appear different to this man, and he wanted to punish them for being different. He threatened them, and three very brave people stepped in, and two lost their lives. Now, in that case, I, I understand. I mean, they were, they were young girls. They probably wouldn't be able to defend themselves unless they'd been to some sort of martial arts class. They probably couldn't defend themselves. And, and it sounds like the, the three people who came to their defense did the right thing. Yes, they very much did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because, in, in, a direct, in a direct conflict. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a judgment call. I mean, no one wants to take anyone's, I hate this word, but agency away. No one wants to take anyone's agency away. But in a life or death situation, or even a situation where someone could be hurt at all, you need to make a snap judgment. And, and if you end up infiltrating a situation that maybe you weren't meant to be a part of, that, that's the price of doing business. You, you were there to help, and you did the best you could. If someone's, I, you know, if someone is in trouble, I run in and help. I don't. Yeah. Know. I'm in there throwing punches and people headlocks, getting them, mm -hmm. off, you know, off, like um, my first bar fight at the Capitol <laughs> happened in Tampa. This one guy uh -huh. grabbed a female friend of mine and was mm -hmm. trying to force her against her will to go up on one of the, um, I think it was one of the, you know, BDSM um, pieces of furniture. Oh, and no. that was not, so I jumped in, I was fucking punching him in the head. Good. Because she very much couldn't, you know, he was much larger than her. He was much larger than me. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Me and a bunch mm -hmm. of friends ended up jumping him and Good. pulling her out of that situation. You, like, I, my mind just shut off, and I just, boom, action. Good. And sometimes if you do that. If someone is in trouble, I help. Fight or flight. Mm, I mean, yes. a lot of my friends wish I was more flight than fight, but I can't walk away if someone needs help. I can't just be sitting there, you know, on the sidelines, just, you know, videoing. I need to jump in. I need to help. Well, I was reminded when, when we were talking about, you know, sort of the more rage-filled expressions. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking about that um, Marlon, big Marlon, what we were talking Wait. about before. Yeah. I was thinking about that. Marlon Riggs. Riggs. Marlon Riggs. But oh. I still won't say the F word. So how about, how about inter do you do um, a lot of interviews, T, or is that... 
it's it's been sporadic, but I mean, you know, I've done a few interviews here and there. It's, okay. I mean, I think the most memorable was the Marilyn Manson concert in 1996. Wow. But what happened? I ended up telling off some Christian protesters, then making out with one of my female friends right in front of them, and they flew into a fucking rage. It was That's glorious. Awesome. And apparent, I still sometimes get, hey, you're that person if I'm wandering around random places, because yeah. people remember that. Mm-hmm. Especially 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. It, you would think we would have progressed more, but we haven't really. But 20 years ago, that was a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. Two, yeah. Any expression of gay romance or gay anything like that was a big deal. It still is. Well, I mean, I, I'm in Oregon, one of the, you know, most progressive areas out there so we don't we don't see it a whole lot but i do still i do still see it i see the hate so it's it's always nice to see the positive outward forms of acceptance you know in the form of signs going up on people's lawns is great yeah it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter what you believe you belong in this community no matter what i mean jacksonville's got a long way to go because First Baptist Church has got a stranglehold on the you know city politics. That's a big church. Um, they're downtown, right? They control most of downtown. Mm-hmm. Let's just they control most of downtown. And in order to have any political power, if you hold public office, you end up having to attend that church. Right. Which is yeah, disgusting. You're disgusting. Well, that's the South. That's what we've been fighting. Mm-hmm. That's what I've been fighting since I was 16. That's what, you know, kickstarted me into activism with how they treated the pagan and the gay community. Right. So. Yeah. If, if you're pagan, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. That's, you know, you're, you're full of the devil. I've had, you know, cops, mm-hmm. you know, because I'm wearing all black and stuff, try to accuse me of doing things that I hadn't done. Well, you look like one of them occultists. You worship Ooh. the devil. You, I don't, I don't like you. No, sir, I don't like you. Is it worse? Meanwhile, is it worse if you're an atheist? Well, God, yes. <laughs> I didn't mean to make it funny, but <laughs> yeah. But meanwhile, they're singling, you know, pagans and atheists out. Yet you got that one pastor, that one, you know, one of the main people that was harassing gays and pagans out here. He mm-hmm. got busted for child molestation. Right. There's so much hypocrisy. I can't I can't begin to express how much hypocrisy there is. And that's because people look at what you say and not what you do. As long as you present well, you say, I'm a Christian. I go to First Baptist Church. People believe you. It doesn't matter what you do when they can't see you. It doesn't matter what you do when they find out. I mean, we elect a no, true. who grabs people by the pussy. I mean, yeah, that, you're yeah. right about oh, that. Yes. So, you know, they don't, as long as you lie and give a good game mm-hmm. and pretend, mm-hmm. you can get away with anything if you're a certain, and you know, if you're white and you have a certain amount of you're money. You're right. You're right. It's all about appearances. And and this town is not any better than a lot of other towns. Nope. But is it getting, do you think it's getting better and do you think it's getting better fast enough? Progress has always been slow in this town and... Yeah. You know, it's as long as we keep fighting. I mean, we finally got the HRO passed, mm-hmm. even with some of the opposition that we've had. And mm-hmm. this has been years in the running. And the gays, you know, the last time threw us the trans people under the bus. Yeah. And now everybody's, you know, this time around, everybody was finally on board defending each other and banding mm-hmm. together, and it got through. So it's it's it just it takes a long time. I was out there for you know documenting some of the first marriage equality rallies that we had, and it took several years for that to finally you know happen. Mm-hmm. It's you know it's just it's just, it just takes a while. We just have to not give up and keep fighting. Mm-hmm. Has the whole has the whole Trump butt fuck kind of um, attempted to put the issues for the LGBT community in the, the in the back of the arena. I mean, are he, people are people are people kind of forgetting that the issue still exists? I mean, parts of his constituency want to forget it still exists. 
mm-hmm. especially when you have conservative gays out there mm-hmm. they are just, you know, fuck you, I got mine. But um, it doesn't matter what they do. It matters what we do in this moment. It matters that we keep fighting and we keep bringing up the issues no matter how much they try to cover it up with shit. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it goes to show that even though you want the LGBT community to be one cohesive community, it's it's still full of individuals. And some of these individuals are self-loathing fucking Suck asses. Right. They're suck asses. They got what they want. They don't give a shit about anyone else. That's, you know, you run into those humans in any group. And what can you do besides just cut them off and be like, no. And go about into what you gotta do. Or you could try to wear them down and be like, "Look, you asshole! You've got your, your you've got. Work. It, doesn't it doesn't work. work. It doesn't. It, okay. Look at Milo Yiannopoulos or whatever the fuck. You oh yeah, name. he's an asshole. It doesn't work. No. There's people that are gonna be assholes no matter what, no matter how. Right. You present the fact. That's true. You know, they're like those flat earthers and all those alt right. <laughs> no matter how much evidence you present. They're going to believe what they want. Mm-hmm. They're they're just assholes. They're ignorant assholes. So you think it's, uh-huh. It's, it's like you just build up your networks, build up your alliances, push out the shitty people. Mm-hmm. That's all you can do. Hey, Ireland, just, as Corel just reminded me, you know, Ireland legalizing marriage equality was huge. That was a big deal. We never thought we'd see that happen. They're so Catholic. They are so Catholic. But but they still haven't legalized abortion. So right? No, but but it was it was people continuing right. to open their mouths. They kept they kept it in the limelight enough mm-hmm. so that action action happened. That's why I would I would hate for I would hate for people to assume that, you know, um it, oh the the gay issue is fixed now in the United States. No. No. We still have a long, long way to go. We have not fixed ourselves, not by half. (laughs) No. There is still prejudice. uh, And there are still limitations. There is still ignorance. There is still bigotry. And the sad thing is I'll probably always be bigotry. We just have to stand up and crush it. We have to crush it. You cannot tolerate bigotry. Yeah, no matter call it, who it call is. It for, call it for what it is. Don't don't bigotry. try to find so yeah. Don't try to find some nice term for it. Well, you a have Nazi, like Nazi is always going to be a Nazi is a Nazi. Yeah. You call a Nazi a Nazi and you know and punch them in the <laughs> fucking mouth. I'm I'm okay with that. Some people didn't like that because I understand no, violence. No. I'm sorry. No, these are the people that want to kill me in mine. Yeah. You do not get to bandy about and say devil's advocate and all this other bullshit or differing viewpoint because you are couching and giving an environment to white supremacy. No, you yeah. stamp it out. My grandfather went over there and fought fucking Nazis. Good. He ended up in the hospital and captured as a POW for fighting fucking Nazis. Okay. I'm going to fight fucking Nazis wherever they lie, no matter what new and pretty label they give themselves. That's a good Nazis point. in the mouth every day. Yeah, That's it's a good not. Point. It's not alt right. It's not alt right. It's Nazi. Yeah, Nazi is Nazi. It's Nazi. You punch him in the fucking mouth. And, and it's a war that didn't end, even though the Germans conceded, the the Axis conceded, the spirit behind it still rages. So we need to fight that war wherever it presents itself. Exactly. So punch Nazis in the face. <laughs> I'm actually okay with it. I, I think I would probably end up in jail still, but I'm okay with it. Uh, Nazis don't get to talk. God damn it, Nazis. Talk. You don't get to talk. I'm punching you in the damn face. You're a Nazi. Yeah, you don't, you, you don't get the right of free speech around me. It doesn't happen. No. You know, your rights end when they infringe on mine. And if right. You're... If your hate speech is getting me and my friends killed, injured, maimed, then mm-hmm. no. It is you know, no. It needs to be curbed. Right. And and I mean someone could say, Oh, but they hadn't done anything to you yet. Well, they were going to. 
That's the point. They want they... genocide. Yeah. For anybody that's a person of color, disabled, queer. Yeah, if you're talking if you're talking about, you know, killing somebody based on your hate of them, um no, your 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 right to say anything has just ended right there. You're you're done. You're you're out of the arena. We're turning off your mic. <laughs> All right. Well, we we have turned you into a spokesperson for LGBTQ LGBT rights, and I did not intend to do that. No person should be a spokesperson for a whole group of people. I would like to know about you as a person. I don't know when you need to end your call. I know you're you, you've got uh, things to do. I have to, to go do. on my next round in about five minutes. So in five minutes, sum up. Please let us know anything you want to tell us about yourself, your dreams, your hopes, your hobbies, whatever. I hope to one day be able to just go outside and not have to worry about somebody killing me for but who I am. That's good. That's a good hope. I want things to be safer for younger LGBT people, especially those who end up in a bad home environment. And mm -hmm. I want them to know that it will get better, and I want to actually make it better for them. You're, you're working for the future. You're a very selfless person. That's very well, I, well, I, for one, am very glad you are on this planet. I am, too. We need more people like you. Sorcerer Zero, my good friend Sorcerer Zero, what are you drinking? I'm going to totally set the tone for the entire discussion. Good. Evil twin liquid <sighs> double bud. That looks delicious. I chocolate, love evil twin. Chocolatey chocolate chocolate imperial twelve percent stout. Nice. You go on. You do that thing. You do it. And I saw I saw your untapped um, review of it, and it, you you marked it really high. I remember I liked it. Evil Twin is very good. This uh, looks yes. like it's pouring. Yes, definitely. Thick. Like chocolate fudge in a glass. Smells roasty. Roasty, roasty. Oh my god, the thickness of it. Man, somebody get me a spoon. See, and I like that. When I have a dessert beer, I like a dessert beer. I swear it's like it's sticking to my, it's sticking to my mouth. All over my tongue and the roof of my mouth and in the back of my teeth and it did not go cheap. Mmm, mmm, mmm. It's a mouth chew meal. It. Have to chew it. <laughs> I know it's so good. It's a dark chocolate. It's this is like you know this is like they melted a dark chocolate bar mm -hmm. into the malt and that's what I'm getting. Yes. It's all dark. Mm -hmm. Not baking, not baking chocolate, mm, but not dark bitter. chocolate. Yeah, just dark. dark chocolate. There are hops. I can taste the hops. Oh, good. Okay. They're definitely along the back of my tongue. Uh huh. They took a back seat this time. They did. Yes, the hops took a back seat. This. Oh my God. There are so many things this could go so well with. Six layer chocolate cake, chocolate fudge birthday cake, chocolate chip pancakes. Mm -hmm. I I would have no problem drinking this for breakfast, or maybe just even like pound cake, so it it would absorb the taste like pound yeah. cake. Oh, you know what? You could mm -hmm. I'll bet you could actually do like a Christmas cake with this and use mm -hmm. this instead of the brandy. <gasps> yes, so awesome. cake in beer. That's awesome. And our friend Sai has just started watching. So for the benefit of our friend Sai, why don't you repeat what you have? Sai so not. this is – our producer is looking a little glum because I took the bottle back. Sai so, so not. this is Evil Twins Liquid Double Fudge. I've had it before. It's excellent. Excellent. I just got to – always got to share with the producer because he's the badass he that makes everything happen. Yeah, he's the badass that makes everything he happen. And he could sabotage us. He could turn off our sound, cut the stream, anything, and we'd be helpless, like God. little girls. Look at it. Sticks to the glass, like you know, yes. you could ski. Like it's trying stuff. to climb out because it's trying to climb out. Yeah, 
Because it has power. Oh. This it has a worth, personality. This was worth every cent I paid. Yep. It certainly is. Well, the ABV. Fantabulous. I'm going to give our very first shout out to another podcast. Thanks to McMenamin's Breweries for having such awesome employees. Thank you so much, McMenamin's, because you totally made our day when this wonderful employee told us she had a podcast. Now, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with the subject. Mm -hmm. It's called, she does a podcast called Click Clack, Mm. and it's about Kendama. Kendama is Kendama is a, a little um I believe it started in Japan. It's a little wooden skill toy. Do you remember the ball in a cup? Like the ball's attached to a string and you have to flip it and get it in the cup. Yeah. This is a little different. It has what looks like a little wooden hammer and a spike on top. Huh. And you use both both physical skill and artistry to create a performance using doing tricks with this yes. little with this ball that's attached this little wooden ball that's attached to a string on this you know this little wooden handle and it's uh-huh. actually pretty interesting to watch i was pretty interested actually watching and the, the link is in the show notes um, okay and the podcast will you know the podcast will tell you all about events and tricks and uh, all kinds of different stuff that you've never thought of about kendama before. Okay. I had no idea. I had no idea this existed or that there are whole conventions about this. Whole conventions. Wow. Cool. I mean, we used to be, you know, we, people used to be surprised there were conventions about Star Trek. Um, kind of, kind of, kind of surprised there is a whole convention dedicated to this little toy that involves such artistry and skill. That is awesome. Well, ev- everything has an audience. I mean, there's a niche for just about everything. Yep. You can you can find uh, the Click Clack podcast on iTunes, and you can also find it on Click Clack Radio through KendamaUSA.com. Do you think the Democrats have been scared enough to start cooperating with each other? Maybe. I think they have a common enemy. One of my problems... I don't know. You know what? The DNC is such a mess. That's one of my problems. I I no longer identify as Democrat. I did for most of my life. But in the last few years, I'm kind of like done with all of it. Because the Democrats can't get their shit together. They um, th- they have no the party. Spine. I detest the party system. I, I do too. I really do. I don't want to be affiliated as anything. And again, you know, like you said, you know, people are only voting the way they vote because they've been told, you know, to vote that right. way. Well, what happens when you don't agree with somebody and they're a Democrat, but you feel, oh, well, I have to vote Democrat anyway. You vote for them anyways. And see, that was the biggest thing during the presidential um, election. I hated it because, you know, I wanted to support the Democrat, but I hate Hillary. I hate her. I hate her. She is an opportunist. She is craggy person. Just didn't, I just don't like her. And, and a lot I, of people agreed with you. Yes. A lot of people agreed with you, and that's where the DNC fell down. Right. They should not have run her. And this is another thing. This is another reason why I dislike Hillary and I dislike the DNC. She had such a sense of entitlement. It was palpable. I felt her sense of entitlement. And the DNC gave her that. They were like, you know what? Of course you're going to be her nominee. It's like they don't yeah. know how to think independently. And that's, that's what did them in because, I mean, it shouldn't be this way, but the Clinton name comes with a lot of negative baggage. I don't think that Hillary should be, you know, held responsible for what her husband did. But the reality of it is that people who hate Bill hate her because of the Clinton name. And so because of that, people who might have been a little more likely to vote for a Democratic candidate, they didn't want to vote for a Clinton and they stayed home 
or they voted for an independent. Either, well, see, and, and we're still, we're still damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Because if we get rid of Trump, we have an Underwood-like character waiting in the wings. Yeah. But we have to get rid of the whole kit and caboodle. I would like and that. I don't, and I Not don't know happen. how. We'd have to redo the entire right. election process. And I don't know how that's going to work. Only after an apocalypse. That's why I'm so fascinated with apocalyptic movies. That's the only way it's going to happen. It, I mean, you know, after the aliens come, Independence Day, yeah. you know, then we start over and we're like, let's just not, no Democrats, no Republicans. Let's just run on people. You say what you stand for. You are not a party. You are a person. Oh, yeah. and that, another thing. Okay, so it's Made in America Week, right? Oh my God. Mar a Lago is is um, requesting more H two visas, whatever they're called, for foreign workers to come for housekeeping services. There are plenty of American people who would be happy to take a job in housekeeping. You cannot tell me that there are not American-born people who would love a job like that, especially the Pay was not bad. I mean, it's not great, but thirteen dollars an hour, fifteen dollars an hour, sixteen dollars an hour—it's not horrible. So they're trying to tell me that he has to have these visas because only foreign workers can do these jobs. No, that's not true. I'm wondering if they're actually using the visas. Are they actually using the visas, or are they just kind of shuffling that money into a different account? I don't know. The article I read said that they applied for the visa, so I don't know. Did I put the no, article? I, I'm on? not. I'm not. Uh, I don't see it. I'm I not, might not have put it here. Yeah, I'm not very experienced with the ins and outs of. Yeah, I just know it's Made in America Week, and he's supposed to be part of it. Is supposed to be hiring American, and that's the opposite of hiring American. Yeah, the oh, it drives me insane. I know. Oh, made in America week, and uh, you know my my favorite uh, my whole favorite the comedy show, you know the the Daily Show. Yeah. Uh, you know they redid the whole advertising thing with the truth about a lot of the stuff that uh, Trump was handling. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know the ties and the hats made in China and. I know uh, the bats made in where was it Brazil or or somewhere uh -huh. else and uh -huh. it's it's it, it is not it's not fake news. People posted pictures of his hats that say made in China. His ties That's say right. made in China. It's not fake news. This is real. It's hypocrisy at at yeah. its most ridiculous. I don't even know where he gets. I agree. Off. I agree, Cybernaut. I love parties too, but not when only two ass hats show up. Everybody's getting water. We're all getting beer. <laughs> beer is made with water. That's right. That's right. What did I say? I mean, I'll be less thirsty than someone who has nothing. Well, I was really lucky this week. Good. I found a UK beer. Ooh, very fascinating. It's called Skull Splitter. Skull Splitter is from Orkney Brewing Company. And the label is really hard to read. It says, it says and it's an original Orcadian ale. I don't know, an authentic Orcadian ale. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. It sounds like it means that orcs made it. Oh, that'd be so cool. That would be cool, because then it would be very smoky and fiery. That would be awesome. Very and I'm beautiful. using my, uh, I'm using my, uh, I don't, actually, I don't know if you'd be able to see the, uh, this is my craft beer picnic. Uh, craft beer picnic mason jar that I got for volunteering at the craft beer picnic. Ooh. I see the picture, but I can't read the words. Pass to the producer. I'm attempting to, but he's uh, he's working too, so it's it's, I, it's hard to. It's, sometimes it's hard to work and drink beer at the same time. It is hard. I have the same problem with coffee mm. when I'm at work. Is it good? To me, it has a fruity and woody aroma. You know what it reminds me of? This reminds 
is the smell of this reminds me of a very old oak forest. I can see that. Like a thousand year forest, like from Game of Thrones. Yeah. From the first peoples. I bet the first peoples made that. Yes. Oh, yeah. The Andals and the whatevers. All that stuff in Daenerys' title. Ooh. Very, very fruity, but fruity like, uh, like preserved fruit. Fruity. Okay. Or preserved fruit and, um, a little tiny bit of spice. I like that. I can't really identify the spice, but yeah, there's definitely plenty of spice in there. Now, what style is mm. it supposed to be? Now, it's weird. It says, it says it's an Orcadian oh, ale. Right. We said that. But I don't know what that's supposed to mean. It's an 8.5% beer. That's good. We're on par. And I can, very flavorful up into my, uh, up in the back of the roof of my mouth. Oh, 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 it says, uh, Corelta says it means it's from the Orkney Islands in Scotland. So the actual, the actual beer is from the Orkney Islands, but this was made in the UK by Orkney Brewing Company. But what style is it supposed yeah. to be? Yeah, yeah, Ork, it's, well. Its own style? I guess it's its own style. I mean, it doesn't. Not all beers follow the BJCP. I know. Yeah, it could be its own thing. I'm putting, I, I found their website, so I'm going to put that in. Yeah, I'm looking, yeah, I've, I've got the, oh, here we go. Here's the, the actual beer itself. It says, a rich, fruity, wine-like complexity on the palate includes fresh and dried fruit, warm, exotic oh, spice, and light, light summer citrus fruits. I'm not getting any... I'm not getting summer citrus. It yeah, tastes like a, it almost tastes like a winter beer to me. Okay. Sophisticated, satiny, smooth with a deceptively light character. Well, very sophisticated. It is very sophisticated. You know what? I would definitely serve this at a high class function. Okay. Like, you know, like for appetizers, like for, mm -hmm. you know, I guess they call them aperitifs. I would serve this in a teeny tiny glass. And serve it around everybody before dinner. That'd be perfect. This is exactly what this beer is for. And also, it's Viking beer. It's back from Viking. the Vikings. It's Viking. It's, it's named oh, no. after Thorfinn Inerson. Cool. You know what? Maybe I should. Maybe I should get a couple of bottles of this for Game of Thrones. And fortitude. Think and about fortitude. it. Fortitude and fortitude. Definitely. That would be perfect. Oh, yes. That's the original Viking people. That would mm. be perfect. And think about their summer, even though it, it tastes kind of warm. That's their summer. Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. Exactly. They're like, oh, it's a balmy negative thirty degrees. Mm. That's their summer. Raisins, raisins. Now I'm getting raisins, raisins off it, and it's got it's got a nice carbonation. Every time I swirl it, it comes up with a head. 